בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, ברוכים הנמצאים, מזל טוב to the uh, hosts, ברוך השם, for this uh, amazing, ברוך השם, new move. הקדוש ברוך הוא bless you guys with a lot of הצלחה in this new house, ברכה, uh, with a lot of שיעת נשמעי and the Torah that's learned in this uh, house, בעזרת השם, and uh, certainly Torah is what got, uh, got us to this point in the first place. Also, big chazak u baruch to the mesayem, siyu masechet. Kadosh b'chuhu yivarech otcha b'kol b'kol kol. You have many more masechetot completed, b'zad Hashem. Shiru Torah tonight will be for Ilui Nishmat Yehuda ben Avraham ve'luna bat Naomi. And also for the refuah shlema for uh, Rabbi Ephraim uh, ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana bat Sarah, Avi Mori David ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris bat Jora. And all of Am Yisrael, all the righteous Noahides that continue to support the organization and all the wonderful things that we're doing, update to everybody that wants to contribute to the new campaign we have. Uh, special Prayers Campaign, that's uh, bhshas.org. Uh, over there, a person can get themselves some extra merits before the Judgment Day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, and uh, whoever wants to be a part of it is uh, more than welcome to. There's a few options. By all means, uh, the um, uh, the wonderful thing about Torah is that if you look into the Torah, you're always going to find the answers. But when people get confused, it's usually because they didn't look at the Torah. So many times, people have a certain perspective of charity, and they think that they're giving something when they give tzedakah, uh, because in essence... They're giving. Somebody else is taking. So in essence, they figure that they're, they're the ones that are giving. Torah has something else to say about it. There was one time a uh, wealthy Syrian Jew that uh, was very connected to Rav Moshe Feinstein. And uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Gdol Ador, Kodesh Kodeshim, but in the... Uh, Safari community wasn't well known yet. And uh, this Syrian Jew wanted to help the Rav. So he organized a uh, dinner in his house. He had a fancy schmancy house, you know, millions of dollars. And he brought his rich friends. And uh, so he brought the rich friends. And then he has uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein there. And uh, the Rav is talking. But really, a lot of the things that he's, uh, he's saying, they're not really understanding because they're, you know, Syrian Syrians, like from Syria, you know, Syrian Jews, but from Syria. So they don't really understand the uh, uh, pronouncement, you know, the way the accent of the Ashkenazim, the words, the, you know, so they're not really understanding and they don't really know who he is so much. Um, so they weren't so impressed. So when the, uh, the host gave some envelopes to everybody, gave envelopes to everybody, and each person would, you know, write a check, and uh, he got the envelopes. Before he gave them to the Rav, he, saw, he looked at the envelopes, and he saw that each guy, you know, gave, you know, $100, $50. He steps around him. He stopped everything. He says, for the Rav, I'm sorry, I have to talk to them in my language. Okay? So the Rav doesn't, uh, and he says to them, this is Rav Vadya said the story. He says, Busha v'cherpa on you guys. Shame on you. You have one of the greatest sages of the generation sitting in front of you. And unfortunately, you guys don't realize it. And you guys, instead of being generous with the wealth that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you, you're giving this paltry sums that you give tzedakah to some uh, thing. I will not have it, he says. So I'm going to decide what each one of you is going to give. He points at one, you're going to give 100,000. The other one, you're going to give 250. You're going to give 400. You're going to give 20. You give each one, he knew how much everybody else has. Everybody agreed. They didn't know. It's Gdolado. They thought it's Ashkenazi rabbi, nice, whatever. Okay, give him $50. They didn't know he's Gdolado. But after he spoke to them in their language, everybody obviously changed the checks and the correct sum came. So Rav Vadya says, Look at this. Here you have 
a situation where a bunch of people are in front of one of the greatest sages of the generation, but they have no idea. So according to them, they're just going to give whatever. Do something nice. Give the guy $50. What's the problem? It's no problem. What is, they don't have anything against him. It's just, I'm not going to write a, a $100,000, $500,000, $100. He says, look how HaKadosh Baruch Hu saved these people because now Rabbi Moshe Feinstein already went to his Olam Abba. All of these people, many years have passed already, he says, and all of these people are also in Olam Abba. But what do you think is happening right now in Shamaim when they show up and then they see the throne that Rav Moshe Feinstein is sitting on, and they're being told in the Bedin of Shamaim that you have a little bit of benefit. Why? Because Rav Moshe Feinstein signed off on you. If you would have given the hundred dollars, what would you get? For people like that, it's a sin. Somebody gives below his means, it's a sin. That's why Rav, the the Chafetz Chaim says that. The people that would be uh, punished the most when the time of Mashiach comes are the people, the, the rich people that didn't give uh, according to their, uh, to their blessing. But that's actually one of the things we wanted to talk about. Bezot Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the words after we say something about Torah. Bezot Hashem, you guys ask some questions. We'll give some of the nice people in uh, TikTok the opportunity to give some questions. We'll even make some fun of some of the terrorists that are there. Bezot Hashem. We'll have some fun. So, we are here instead of my comfortable home because there's a bracha. What's the bracha? HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided that this young couple, that Baruch Hashem had an extraordinary journey over the last several years, needs an upgrade in life, needs to move from where they were to where they want to be. But why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu give blessings? Why? You know, it's, 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 this is something that everybody wants blessings. So really the big question is, what's the biggest blessing you can possibly have? Now it's an odd question to ask during Parashat Kitavo because everyone that's been watching my shurim for the last 10 years, they're used to talking about the curses. The curses, the punishments, the Hashem Yachem, the Kadachat, the tzapa, all the horrible things that happen to sinners. But really... Perhaps we need to talk about the blessings too because that's the first half of the parasha. What's the biggest blessing? What's the biggest blessing that a person gets? Now, if you're going to say, oh, a house is a blessing, then you have to answer this story. This rabbi in Eretz Yisrael, his name is Rav Leo Kachlon. And I heard this from Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon, my rabbi. And he told a story one time, a true story, where a guy, a multi-millionaire, just bought, built a house, million dollar house. And, you know, a million dollars over there is worth more than a million dollars in America. A million dollars in America, you could buy lunch. Over there, you could actually buy a house. And uh, he built a whole million dollar house with all the gadgets and all the things. And he wanted to have, you know, housewarming. So he invited his friends over. And he's showing everybody the house. Not really sure why people do that. They show people the house. I remember myself doing that when I was still on Wall Street and stupid. And people would come to my house and uh, I would show them the bowling alley and the basketball court and the uh, 35th floor and the balcony of 400 square feet and the 35th floor. And you show people the house and the bedroom and this. It's a horrible thing to do. Why it's a horrible thing to do? Listen to the story. So he's showing them the house, he's showing them the bells, the whistles, the chandeliers, all these wonderful things. All of a sudden, one of his friends, who's also well-to-do, even more than him, takes him to the side. He's like, let me ask you something. How much you spend in this house? He goes, ah, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry, enjoy, 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 enjoy the, the private chefs and the, the, the food, and enjoy, enjoy the chandeliers, enjoy. He goes, no, 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 I want to know how much, how much, how much you spend is it really matter? He goes, yeah, no, no, I just want to know. A million dollars. Okay. I give you three million dollars right now. You give me the keys? He goes, no, come on, stop it. He goes, no, I'm serious. I have a checkbook on me. I'll all, on the phone, I'll send you three million dollars right now. You give me the keys. You leave right now, I take everything, with a house with everything in it. 
guy is, is like, serious? Yeah, serious. So well, let me ask my wife. He goes to his wife. She goes, sure, why not? She's happy, great. <laughs> why not? On the spot, at the housewarming. Turns from a housewarming to the purchase. He sells the house for $3 million. Is that a blessing or a curse? No? We're starting the question with me, to share with you guys. Is that a blessing or a curse? curse. Why is it a curse? Did you have opportunity to enjoy it? Said I enjoyed. He's going to enjoy something else for $3 million. The answer is that it's a curse. Why it's a curse, though? Why is it a curse? Because by living a building a house without Torah, all you have is a physical entity that's useless. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow, you can't take it with you. And when he had no Torah, that also meant that he's friends with people that don't have Torah. And that means that in order for him to continue his friendship with these friends, they have to continue living a mindset without Torah. So instead of having a housewarming where you have a shiur Torah, you get some chizuk, you try to, uh, to, to publicize a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name, what is he doing? He's publicizing the chandeliers, he's publicizing the walls, he's publicizing the digital TV, he's publicizing all of those different things, all of which are a sin from a Torah of lo tachmod. Do not covet. One of the sins of the Ten Commandments, lo pachot no more, no less. Lo tachvod. What is he doing? He's showing them the house. He's making them jealous. They're looking at the house. They're becoming jealous. Everybody is sinning. Everybody has to pay that that uh, punishment in Gainom. For what? For a housewarming party. You went to a housewarming party? He's going to have to be cooked in Gainom for a few months. Why? For the housewarming party. Why? He's jealous of the chandelier. He's jealous of the frames of the picture. He's jealous of everything. To such an extent of jealousy that he's willing to pay $3 million, just give it to me. I don't want to build it. It's also the arrogance. It's also jealous. It's a, not just jealousy. It's arrogance. It's, it's simply disgusting behavior. But in the world without Torah, it's viewed as a blessing. He's going to tell his friends, look, I had a housewarming party. I made $2 million on my housewarming party. They're going to tell me you should do a housewarming party every week. They're going to think it's a blessing. But in reality, it's the biggest curse in the world. But they don't realize what's a curse. And that's actually the worst curse of all. The worst curse of all the curses is a curse that you don't even realize exists. You, don't even, you live a life without even knowing that you're sinning. That's the worst of all. It's like somebody has a terminal disease, but they still go to work every day because they don't know they're dying. He has a month to live, but he still goes to work 10 hours a day. If he knew he has only a month to live, the last thing he would do is go to work. He's going to live his life. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. I don't know, spend some time with loved ones, do something useful. He's not going to go to work. That's why it's the worst curse. The worst curse is a person that's living a life without even realizing that he's going in the wrong direction. Now, Parashat Kitavo is known... For its curses. But there are blessings in there. But we have to figure out what is really the biggest blessing. We just figured out what the biggest curse is. What's the biggest blessing? Now, it starts off by telling us, that you shall take of the first of every fruit of the ground. He's talking about what's going to happen once we get to Eretz Yisrael. This is, of course, many years ago. And uh, once Am Yisrael would go into Eretz Yisrael, they had to fulfill certain commandments. One of them was the Bikurim, which is the uh, first fruits. It says that you shall take the first of every fruit of the ground that you bring, from the land, from your land that Hashem, your, your God, gives you, and you shall put it in a basket. You shall go to the place that Hashem, uh, your God, will choose to rest His name there. He's talking about the Bet Hamikdash. Now, Chachamim say, what does it really mean? This, you shall put it in the basket. 
How is it relevant to today? Because the Gemara in Masechet Megillah says that every single thing that's mentioned in the Torah or Tanakh is something that's relevant in every single generation. Chachamim say the basket, really, the Or Chaim HaKadosh brings it. He says the basket is the Shas, is the, every Masechet, 60 Masechtot. The uh, same, the Gimatria of Tene. The Gimatria of Tene is 60, uh, as, a, uh, as a hint, towards the 60 Masechtot of the Talmud Babri, Talmud Yerushalmi. So, if a person wants to show up to Shemaim with something on Rosh Hashanah, we're now in Elul, we're getting ready for the Judgment Day, the biggest thing that a person can bring to his Judgment Day is Torah. And not just Torah, but the highest level of Torah. Hence the reason why we started a year ago this whole plan of getting people to not just learn Torah like we did every year, but to get people to commit to learning the entire Talmud Bavli in a single year. Baruch Hashem, many people have completed it. Uh, we even have one guy that did it three times. We have a, uh, you know, it's literally the, the, the amount of achievement, the whole point of it is to show everybody else that's not doing it what's possible. What's possible? Somebody uh, asked me about it. A uh, friend of mine asked me about it. What's the whole event about this, that? And uh, it's a big event. You could, you know, the venue could fit thousands of people. I said, it's not going to be thousands of people. It's going to be probably about 600 people. But the, uh, the venue itself is a, uh, not, a, not, not cheap. But really, the biggest expense is to help all the poor families, many of which are these people that are completing the Shas in a single year. That's the biggest expense. That we're talking about more than half of the expense, or even sixty percent of the expense, going to be towards that. But it's a worthwhile expense because you know that each one you helped, you got yourself a shas. You got yourself a shas in a single year, and it's supposed to motivate. Baruch Hashem, it's already inspired a few of my students online. One guy already took on himself to complete the shas in a single year. He already is day every day he sends me that he completed seven dapim. So now he's at day 14, he just completed seven pages in one day. Seven dapim, not pages, seven dapim, that's really 28. I have another guy, relatively new about tshuva, took on himself to learn the entire Mishnah in a single year. The point of all of this is to show people what's possible. So if a person, you know, thinks, okay, listen, I learn an hour, two hours a day, three hours a day, and I'm doing good. But then he hears that somebody else also learned three and a half hours, but he completed the shas in a single year. He has to question himself. He has to qu- Am I really pushing myself to my limits or no? Now, sometimes a person can't learn three, four hours. He works, he's busy with a lot of other things. Then a Kadosh Baruch gives us an opportunity to use the blessing that you got to still acquire Torah. How? Use the money. You work so much, that means you're making money. Use the money you have to invest into the Torah, to sponsor things like this. Why? Because the point is, when you go up to Shemaim, you're going to want to learn Torah. Why? Because that's the greatest thing in the world in Shemaim. It's not, there's no, there's no uh, eating, uh, uh, you know, a uh, bamba and beastly in Shemaim. Uh, the greatest pleasure in the world is learn Torah. But what Torah are you going to learn? What Torah are you going to learn? Whatever Torah you learned here is what you're going to learn over there. Meaning, if you learned over here... Just a uh, uh, basic level, you know, stories for kids that, uh, you know, you, uh, you read a three, you know, a five-page book because you read the book for that you read, you, you read to your infant, your one-year-old. That's your Torah. In Shammai, that's what you're going to learn if you even make it to heaven. But if you toiled in Torah, you went into the Gemara, you went into the Talmud Bavli, Talmud Shasmi, uh, Yerushalmi, you went to the Zohar, the Midrash, all of these different things. That's what you're going to learn, but expand it much, much bigger than what you have here. But the Torah is wider than the ocean. So how am I going to be able, I can't learn all of these things. Right now I'm just starting, I'm just about Shuvah, I'm a convert for two, three, four, five, six years. How can I ever go, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even finished with the Shas, how am I going to get to the Zohar, how am I going to get to the Shukhan how am I going to get to all these different things? That's the key. When you get involved by sponsoring Avrechim, Whatever they are learning goes to your merit also. Meaning, in Shemaim, automatically whatever they learned, that's what you know. 
That's what you learn. Whatever their he, he ended up learning certain things, you're going to learn that too. So already you see that the Pasha starts off with a hint towards a great blessing, which is the Torah. But what can we do that most people don't really understand that? Most people, they think the Torah is something ancient. They think that maybe they could learn from YouTube videos about how to be a, uh, a good salesman from some guy that declared bankruptcy five times. Or they want to learn from a guy like Tony Robbins the secrets to marriage, even though he's been divorced four times and he's accused for sexual harassment at least ten times. So a person that doesn't know Torah doesn't know what he's missing. So the Torah continues in Parashat Kitavo in verse number 7, chapter 26. Verse number 7. It says, And then we prayed before Hashem, the God of our forefathers. Why we prayed them before? Why? And Hashem accepted our prayer. And it was revealed before Him our toil and our exhaustion and our oppression. Here Moshe Rabbeinu is telling Am Yisrael about how we're always going to have to remember that we were in Egypt, we were slaves, we were being murdered, we were being tortured, but eventually HaKadosh Baruch who heard our prayers. But just so you know, this same HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the God of our forefathers. Like what's the, why do I, okay, I understand he's God. Why do I have to constantly mention that God is the God of our forefathers? It's either you know it or you don't know it. If you already told me once that he's God, obviously he's God of everyone. And if you want to make sure that I know, you tell me one time in the Torah. Hashem, the God of our forefathers. But it doesn't do that. Almost every single time that Kadosh Baruch Hu is mentioned, it constantly says, God, the God of our forefathers. In your prayer, every single day, you start off Amidah. Elo Avraham, Elo Yitzchak, Elo Yaakov. The God of Avraham, the God of Yitzchak, the God of Yaakov. Why do I have to constantly mention that he's the God of the forefathers? If you need... That reminder, because you have that kind of a, a memory, you're probably a shote. You probably don't have to do mitzvot. You probably have to go be instituted somewhere. So it's not for that. There has to be a bigger reason of why Moshe Rabbeinu is telling us here, we prayed before Hashem, the God of our forefathers. And this is repeated across the entire Torah. I thought, with Siyat Dishmaya that you have, at the very least, a few reasons. The first reason is because every Jew has to remember where he came from. Not just that you came from your parents and you grew up in New York, or you grew up in Haiti, or you grew up in uh, Netanya, or you grew up in uh, California. No, no, no. Where did you come from? What, where, where, where did you come from? Where is this neshama that's called you? Where did it come from? Why? Because once a person understands where he comes from truly, it gives him a certain amount of obligation. Because if you, for example, you meet somebody and you see the guys walking around like a lot of people today, they walk around with a t-shirt and shorts, they look homeless almost. And then the guy walks into a, uh, opens up a car, he has a little remote control fob thingy, and he's opening up the door to a uh, $500,000 car. You are about to give him a dollar to help him out, hopefully to get, get some food to eat, and he's opening a door for a $500,000 car. It happens all the time. It's this new look. I guess there's a new fashion statement called homelessness. But the car and the watch, you could buy five houses with them. So now all of a sudden, oh, so he comes from something. He comes from money, the guy. All of you have a different level of respect for him. He goes, oh, it's probably stylish homeless clothes. It's probably like a you know, $500 homeless shirt and a $1,000 homeless uh, jeans. And even the flip-flops are probably at least $600 homeless flip-flops. The designer probably lives in a garbage bag that's probably at least $1,000. But that's what it is. 
But once you saw where he's coming, where, where he's going, you have a different level of respect to the guy. When a Jew understands where he comes from, that he comes from Avraham, that was happy to go sacrifice the love of his life, his son Yitzchak, just for the sake of doing what Hashem said. Yitzchak, that was willing to be the sacrifice. Why? Because that's what Hashem said. Yaakov, that lived an entire life of suffering with the exception of the last 17 years of his life. Whether it's the suffering from Lavan chasing him, trying to you know torture him in every different way, or it's Esav trying to kill him, or it's the different issues with his wife, or it's uh, you know the problems with his kids, Yosef, literally a life of suffering. Never once you see any questions in the mind of Yaakov about what his responsibility in the world is. When a Jew understands where he comes from, automatically it gives him a certain sense of responsibility, but also a certain sense of self-respect. This is where I come from. But if he stops at that, it doesn't help. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu reminds us not once, not twice, but many, many times that we are, that he is the God of our forefathers and we are those descendants. Because the second thing is that a person needs to be reminded to compare their actions versus those forefathers. He was willing to sacrifice his son just to do the will of Hashem. Are you willing to sacrifice your time to even hear what Hashem said? Are you willing to sacrifice a day out of the week to connect to Hashem? It's called Shabbat. Are you willing to sacrifice some of the money that you have in order to publicize the name of Hashem? What are you willing to, what are you willing to sacrifice for HaKadosh Baruch Hu? A fool that doesn't connect to Avraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov is going to say, oh, why does Hashem need my sacrifice? Who says he needs it? Who says he needs it, you chamor? Who says he needs it? Only heretics say he needs anything. You need it. If you, are, if you understand that you are connected to Avraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov at the very least, compare yourself to where they are. I'm not saying become Avraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov, but at the very least, in your own capabilities... What are you doing that shows that you really come from that family? The third thing, which I think is the nail that really sells everything in, is that it's a reminder to each and every single one of us that when we see Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov, in our prayer, in every parasha, in every book, in every, everywhere you constantly see Hashem, the God of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. It reminds us of the reward that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives to somebody that does His will. Just think about it. Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov lived 4,000 years ago almost. Almost 4,000 years ago when we got the Torah 3,334 years ago, almost 3,335. Right? Yaakov came to, to, uh, to Egypt 210 years before that. 210 years before that. You're already at over 3,500. By the time you get to Avraham and the Akedah, you're talking about a few hundred years. We're talking about almost 4,000 years ago is Avraham and the Akedah. Almost 4,000 years ago is Yitzchak and the Akedah. Almost 4,000 years ago is Yaakov and all of the Nisyonot that he had, all of the different difficulties that he had. But we're still mentioning his name, every single Orthodox Jew, every Jew that prays every day, every Jew that learns Torah, whether he's four years old, six years old, nine years old, 50 years old, 500 years old, whatever age he is, every single Jew mentions their name every single day. Why? They did the will of Hashem almost 4,000 years ago. This is a Kadosh Baruch Hu reminding you 
if HaKadosh Baruch Hu is rewarding them in this world, they're not even here. They're in Shemaim getting the greatest benefit they could possibly get, but they're still getting rewarded here. They're still getting the honor here. For what? For doing the will of Hashem a few, a few thousand years ago. What is HaKadosh Baruch Hu going to give you if you do the will of Hashem? Almost 4,000 years they're getting their name mentioned, they're getting their name honored for doing the will of Hashem. What is a Jew going to get for keeping Shabbat? What is a Jew going to get for giving tzedakah? What is a Jew going to get for learning Torah and publicizing the name of Hashem? What is a Jew going to do get if he's protecting his wheat? He doesn't look at the imadas things. What is he going to get? If Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov for almost 4,000 years, they're mentioned by every single Jew for all of the generations and forever, every single day, all day. The Torah is never going to change. That means that in Shemaim, they're learning the same thing. In Shemaim, when David Melech is learning Torah, when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is learning Torah, he has a yeshiva in Shemaim. There's a yeshiva of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The yeshiva of David Melech. The yeshiva of Avraham, the yeshiva, everyone has a yeshiva. They have students. They're learning the same exact Torah. And this week, Parashat is saying, yeah, it's, you know, it says over here, it says Hashem. But it doesn't just say Hashem. It says Hashem, Eloke Avraham, Eloke Yitzchak, I'm Avraham. I'm here. I'm, I'm in the Torah. For what? For 4,000 years ago. Every single kid one of the first things he learns in the Torah is Elkei Avraham, Elkei Yitzchak, Elkei Yaakov. Why? Because they did the will of Hashem almost 4,000 years ago. What are you going to get for coming to a Shul Torah on a Wednesday at 9 o'clock? What is a woman going to get for putting a mitpachat on her head instead of one of these uh, uh, horse tails that makes her look more single than a single woman? Poor woman contacted me recently. I'm trying to help her. God bless her. Hashem Hashem on her. She says, I'm doing tshuva. I've been through my whole life, but really, I'm suffering nonstop. Problems with the marriage, problems with this, problems with that, problems, problems, problems. Not money problems. Not uh, health problems. But life is horrible. And she goes, I know why. She tells me, I know why. I'm that woman that you keep talking about in your shurim that's wearing a wig longer than the exile and a shirt, shorter than the uh, Shem Yishmar V'yatzim. I figured I'd be from and fancy, and now I'm suffering for it. The husband doesn't want to talk to her. As beautiful she is, a Kadosh Baruch Hu made his eyes blind. He doesn't want to look at her. The kids don't want to listen to her. As good as their ears are, they don't work. Why? Because you went again. You went against the Kadosh Baruch Hu. You went against the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Yeah, but I keep Shabbos. Yeah, in Shemaim they also keep Shabbos. Genom, there's a certain section shuts off on Shabbat. There's other mitzvot. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, don't follow what's in your heart, don't follow what's in your eyes, don't follow the immodesty, don't follow the ways of the goyim. Don't follow. Who says you can follow it? Frum and fancy. You think Sarai Men was frum and fancy? No one says you have to look like a garbage pail. But who says that you walk around with uh, no, no sleeves, no nothing, Shem Yishmo. The way we're going, we're lucky if people continue to wear clothes anymore. Going back to Stone Age. She's going to walk around with a leaf. Think she's Chava. But that's the thing. When a Jewish woman sees the Pasuk and says, oh yeah, I'm uh, the daughter of uh, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And she doesn't realize, wait, I'm the daughter of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? That's where I come from? How do I act in comparison to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov and their Rebbe sins? 
their, their wives. And even more so, what kind of reward are they getting? What am I going to get? That depends on question number two. That depends on question number two. How did you answer as far as your acts versus their acts? Then the parasha tells us that when a person is giving ma'asir, says in verse number 10, chapter 26, And now behold, I have brought before you the first of the fruit of the ground that you have given me, O Hashem. Why does Moshe Rabbeinu feel the need to tell us that he's bringing this sacrifice, he's bringing this fruits to Hashem, but really he got it from Hashem. I'm bringing this fruit, I'm bringing this sacrifice, that you have given me Hashem. Why is it that 3,334 years after Moshe Rabbeinu wrote this, we have to constantly remind ourselves, you have given me Hashem. This is much simpler to understand. Because if you don't understand it, you have no share in the world of Torah. Whether you have a million or a billion, a hundred dollars or five houses, one car or five cars, one kid or a house full of kids. If you think anything you have came from you and not from Hashem, you have no share of the world of Torah. The Ramban writes in Parashat Bo, anyone that believes that there is anything natural in the world and it's not from Hashem has no share of the Torah of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Everything is miraculous. There is no such thing as nature. Nature is just simply how Hashem makes it look realistic in our lowly minds. There is no nature. You got a house? Don't think it's because of the interest rates. It's because a good opportunity and you found the house on the internet right before it went on the market. You got a car, it's a good deal, but he really needed to get rid of it. I picked a good stock and it went up, the right timing. If you think anything like that, it's kfirag mura. It's complete heresy. Why? Everything comes from Hashem. Including even something as simple as, I'm bringing the fruit to fulfill this mitzvah, but in reality Hashem, you gave it to me. It's like a father plays with the kids. Okay, let's play store. I'll be the store and you buy something for me. And the little kid says, okay, what are you selling? Oh, I have the toys, I have books, I have this. Okay, great. Oh, wait, I don't have any money. So what does the father do? Oh, here's money. So the kid comes to the store. Okay, I'll take the book. I'll take, I'll take everything. He wants to buy everything. Why? It's Abba's money anyway. When a person is stingy when it comes to mitzvot and he buys the cheap etrog, he donates a little bit less because it doesn't add up with the math. He doesn't move into the house in the Jewish community. He moves 50 miles outside. Hopefully he could go there with a horse. When you're stingy with mitzvot, you're forgetting where you got the money in the first place. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is reminding us simple blessing that some people don't even realize they have. Next the Torah tells us something even more extraordinary. Because this is the Ashkafa of how a Jew is supposed to look at money altogether. After he fulfilled the mitzvah, he brought these fruits. He's supposed to make a statement, says Moshe Rabbeinu. What's the statement? Person supposed to say, 
after all you this all the maaser that you gave, you shall say before Hashem your God, I have eliminated the holy thing, meaning the maaser, from the house, and I have also given the maaser ishon to the levi, also to the convert, to the orphan, to the widow, according to your commandments. And according to your entire commandments that you commanded me, I have not transgressed any of your commandments and I have not forgotten you. Here we have two main things. First of all, you just gave myself. Why do you call it Bialti? Bialti is I have eliminated. Bialti at the Kodesh, I have eliminated the holy. And then you say, I have not forgotten. Yeah, obviously, if you did the mitzvah, you didn't forget. If a Jew has the right mindset of money, he just got paid a thousand dollars. He just got paid ten thousand dollars. He just got paid a hundred million. Whatever he got paid, it went into his bank. He got a suitcase full of cash. Whatever he got, if he has the right perspective on money, the second he sees money is in the account, he doesn't look at it as his money. Why? He hasn't given Marcel yet. I have something holy in my hands right now. It doesn't belong to me. I have, I have eliminated the holy, meaning I gave the master. Now that I gave the master, now what I have is mine. It's like having the Aron Kodesh in your house. Does it belong in your house? No. It's like having the Ten Commandments in your house. Does it belong in your house? No. Why? There's a place for that. When a person has the right perspective of money, they're not looking at it as like, oh yeah, I got this and I got this and I got this. No, 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 no. You're not understanding. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you that just so you could do more mitzvot. Sure, you have to eat, you have to drink, you have to pay the bills, all that stuff. But first, you have to remember. Where did you get it from? And that's why it says at the end, I have not forgotten. Why I have not forgotten? Because the Torah says also in Sefer Dvarim, one of the commandments that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us, what is it? After I give you all the blessings, don't forget me. What do you mean don't forget? You gave me the blessing, I'm going to forget you? Exactly. Yes, that's what happens. That's exactly what happens. When he was poor, barely making ends meet, he was praying to Hashem, please Hashem, help me, please Hashem, crying with tears. You know, a flood came out of his face. She's reading Tehillim, the whole book every day. All of a sudden, there's a few zeros next to their net worth. All of a sudden, you want to come to Shul Torah? No, I'm busy. Why? I have a business meeting. Oh. You want to maybe get involved with the uh, synagogue? Perhaps we get some more people. No, I'm sorry, I'm busy. What? I'm having a, uh, a get-together at my house. You want to sponsor some Torah? No, no, I'm sorry. We just got our second house. Can't do it. Ah, you forgot about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When you didn't have food to eat, you prayed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu day and night, but now that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you more than enough, what happened? You forgot about Hashem. So here when a person gives the, gets rid, eliminates, eliminates the part that he knows does not belong to him. He says, Hashem, I, this, is, this is a sign I didn't forget. Maybe I didn't study as much as I need to study. Surely I could always do more. Maybe I could be a little more this. Maybe I could be a little more that. But at the very least, with this mitzvah right now, I didn't forget you. I didn't forget where I came from. The next part of the Torah, it says, something that's an obligation on every single Jew to such an extent that the Gemara says in Masechet Chagigah, that if he doesn't do this mitzvah, it was better off that he didn't come to the world. Many things in the Torah, it says, you do it good, you don't do it, you have a problem. But rarely does it say, you do it good, you don't do it, it was better off you didn't come to the world. Why? The punishment is going to be so horrible, it was better off you not to be born. Why? You're simply not fulfilling your purpose. Like imagine you have 
somebody invented what he calls some type of, I don't know, a rocket. But the rocket doesn't fly. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't turn on. He invented a car. But the car doesn't drive. doesn't move. doesn't turn on. Ever. Can't fix it. It was better off. He never used the money to, to, to build it. It's a waste. This is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says about this mitzvah. What mitzvah is this? Says the Torah, an aliyah shlishit, this is the third aliyah, chapter 26, verse number 16. Ayom hazeh Adonai Elohecha mitzavecha la'asot et ha-chukim ha'ele ve'et ha-mishpatim ha'ele ve'shamarta ve'asita otam b'kol levavecha o'b'kol mishpatecha ve'kol nefashecha et Adonai e'emarta ayom liyot lecha le'eloim ve'lelechem b'dracha ve'lishmo chuka v'mitzvata v'mishpatav here, Moshe Rabbeinu summarizes everything, puts everything into right perspective, and he says the follows. This day, Hashem your God commands you to perform these decrees and the judgments, and you shall observe, observe and perform them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have distinguished Hashem today to be a God for you and to walk in His ways. And to observe his decrees, his commandments, and his judgments. And to listen to his voice. We've heard this before. But here there's a few unique words that Moshe Rabbeinu is using. He says, following these mitzvot means you distinguish Hashem. Onkelo says, means you to glorify Hashem. What does it mean to glorify Hashem? What does it mean to distinguish Hashem? What does it mean? Distinguishing or glorifying a Kadosh Baruch Hu means that you showed that you feel and you view Him differently from anything else. Or a goal that it's your feeling and your action for your own benefit. Meaning that you have distinguished him. You have empowered him. You've glorified him. Sorry, not empowered him. You've glorified him. You've distinguished him because of your actions. From anything else. What's anything else? All the other gods that people think exist. The God of money, the God of beauty, the God of uh, fame, the God of, uh, of uh, YouTube likes, of TikTok, all of these false gods that people chase. By you following the mitzvot, without exception, that means you put God above everything else. But that does not mean that you've empowered Him. Because all of this glory and distinguishing that you did is for your good. It's your feeling as a result of your actions. Whether you glorified him and distinguished him or not, he was still glorious. He was still all-powerful. It's just that once you follow the Torah, you've acknowledged it and adapted and applied it to your life. But you didn't empower him as if he needed or benefited from it. It's your benefit alone due to your act. But then you say, yeah, but then after that it says that Hashem distinguished Am Yisrael. So why is it compared? Why is us distinguishing Hashem right next to Hashem distinguishing us? Why is that compared? Because his distinguishing you is also to your benefit. And the only reason why they're next to each other is because it's as a, his distinguishing you is as a result of the actions of your forefathers that we already talked about, of their actions. They glorified him. They distinguished him. And you're benefiting from it too. 
4,000 years after they already left this world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is still giving their children a benefit. What is he going to give you for keeping Shabbat? What is he going to give you for all of the mitzvot that you're doing? If for their life and their world, when they didn't have all of the pornography of this world, all of the filth of this world, they're different tests. If they got a benefit for all these thousands of eternal benefit, what are you going to get for overcoming the test that you have to go? So now a person has to ask himself, how do we get from there to the greatest of blessings? All these blessings sound good. All of the blessings sound good. What's the greatest blessing? If you notice, anyone that follows the different rabbinim, different rabbis out there in the world today, you'll notice that the ones that are the most successful in helping people do tshuva and have the most amount of fame and real success, not fame because of subscribers or selling books, but actually transforms people's lives, are themselves Baal Tshuva. You have many Chachamim in the world. Big Chachamim. Some even Gdole Adol. You see them, they make a video, 15 people watch it. But then you see some new guy. Not too long ago, he was himself a criminal. He gives a shiul. Five people do tshuva. You ask a person that's been religious, rabbi in the yeshiva, have you helped people do tshuva, transform their lives? Yeah, you know, probably four or five. What, four or five this today? Four or five this week? No, four or five over the last uh, 20 years, like this rabbi told me in Canada. 20 years, he made four or five people do tshuva. I think two of them are him and his wife. But then you see, Irgun Be'ezat Hashem, our organization, Shtabach Shimolad, you see the statistics. But the statistics are a lie. Why? To a 12,000 shurim, we have online between myself, Rabbi Ephraim, some of the other rabbinim in the organization, the million and a half CDs and, uh, and the USB, all that's, it's a lie. Why is it a lie? Because much more than that was done. One person starts keeping Torah, they get married, they have three, four little cute kids, they're all keeping Torah and mitzvot, they're all making, I don't know, 500, 1,000 mitzvot a day. Each week, you have tens of thousands of mitzvot. Each year, you have millions and millions of mitzvot. More kids, next generation, next generation, next generation. There's no number that can count it. And that's just one family. There's no shiul that you're going to go on our channel. And you're not going to see somebody say, this transformed my life. This changed my life. We have Baruch Hashem a podcast now that God bless him, Sonny is doing. You see all these wonderful stories. But the stories are like, you have to like literally like understand the depth of it. Wait a minute. This guy did tshuva. He's in Vegas. That guy did tshuva. He's in Arizona. That one did tshuva. He's in New York. That one did tshuva. But they didn't just do tshuva by themselves. They started keeping Shabbat and that's it, finished. No, he started learning Torah. He got married. He built a house. He has kids. Everybody's going to yeshiva. Everybody's everybody's from. He's more religious than some of the rabbis. And now he got his sister to do it, and his brother to do it, and his cousin to do it. He literally became a little kiruv machine. And that's just one story, and another story, another story. And you have this Baruch Hashem all over the world. And now we have Baruch Hashem because there was a lot of uh, tzaddikot that wanted to. Tell their story also, but because for the issues of modesty and protecting their own honor, we don't want to put them on video. So what we're doing, we're doing a 
a different, a set up, separate uh, podcast where we're having one of our uh, tzaddikot from the organization interview women, asking them similar questions to what Sunny does on his videos, just only audio. And then we have to make a nice video of it, but it's shame over the next uh, week or two. We're going to start publishing them. Probably going to be more than, uh, you know, a couple of times a week or whatever. And you see each one of these stories, what these people say. This, some of them came from, like, literally, a third or fourth chamber of Gehenom. They were already in Gehenom. They came, they're in this world, they're living in Gan Eden. Why? They read a book, they uh, watched the film. All of these wonderful things. So yeah, you look at these numbers, oh yeah, wow, 40, 50, 100,000 subscribers, and see, it's, it's a lie. Because the effect is a million times greater than that. But then you go and you have some really bigger tummy decha chavim that I could ever be, and then they come and they they make a video, you know. Okay, maybe him, his wife, and a few kids are going to watch it, and that's it. Or even if 100, 500 people watch it, 1,000, 10,000 people watch it. Nobody does tshuva. Well, they like it, they attend the shiur, they even give a little tzedakah, but everybody stays the same. They go home and stay the same. Why does a Kadosh Baruch Hu decide to do this? But it's not just me. You look at all of the most successful people in Zikuya Rabin, it's always the same story. It's always somebody that's a Baal Tshuva, that didn't grow up exactly in the world of Torah or in the Yeshiva. Or, or, but all of a sudden he has a reputation uh, and fame, you know, like a Gdolado. Like, who is this little chupchik? Who is this little zero over here? He's getting uh, these people to transform their lives. The whole community was just built because of... Who is this guy? Does he even know Aleph Bet? What, how did he do this? The big, biggest rabbi in the world came to the community. People didn't change even the Tilat Yadayim. This guy came. People are doing tshuva, converting. Who is this guy? And this is, and this is not one story. It's not just me. All of the most successful... Uh, uh, People that do Zikuya Rabim, same story. Everybody's got their own version. One died, came back to life. One was a base, one of that. But you see it in Hebrew and English, different languages, the same exact thing. Oh, why? Why? Why does the Kadosh Baruch Hu do it? The answer to that is the same answer of why we're even doing these podcasts. And it's also going to answer our big question of what's the biggest blessing. And once we have that answer... I think we have an understanding of what does it mean to be a descendant of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. The Torah says that when the prophets came, prophecy came out of their mouth as if it was beyond their control. This is the reason why when HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Yonah to give the prophecy to the people of Nineveh, Yonah, Yonah ran away. Why are you running away? You didn't want to give them the prophecy. So what, the prophecy is not going to come to you if you're on a boat? Whether you're on a boat or you're over there, it's going to come. No, no. If it comes while I'm on a boat and I say it, they're not there to hear it. But if I'm there... And it comes out, they're going to hear it. What do you mean? Don't say it. It doesn't work like that. Once you are at the place where you're supposed to be, it just came out. It was like burning them with fire coming out. Words just came out without a plan, without an order, without a structure, without preparation, without notes, without source sheet, nothing. Just came out the word of God. That's the prophet. Now, the Yetzirah is called Ra. But he's also called six other names. Really, he has more than that. The Gemara in Masechet Sukkah, page 52a, says that he has seven names. Rabbi Yeshua ben Navi, who knew the Yetzirah personally, because he gave him a tour of Gehenom, he gave him a tour of Gan Eden, he ran away from him, jumped into Gan Eden, never came out, stayed in Gan Eden. One of the ten people that went to Gan Eden alive. From him we also know a lot of the interesting details about Gehenom because he saw it while alive and came back to report it. 
Anyway, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi tells us this Yetzirah has seven names. HaKadosh Baruch Hu called them Ra, called them evil. Moshe Rabbeinu called them Aren, uncircumcised. David the Melech called them Tameh, impure. Shlomo HaMelech called them Sone, hater, or the enemy. Isaiah the prophet called them Michshol, stumbling block. Yechizkel called them Evin, stone. And Yoel and Avi called them Tzfoni. Which translates to something distant or a hidden one. What's Tzafon? The prophet Job said, go to the Tzafon and get gold. You want to get gold? Go to the Tzafon. South. So it comes from there. So out of all the names, Chachamim tell us these are not necessarily just names. These are different attributes that the Satan has comes to you in different ways. The worst one is the seventh one. Why the seventh one? When he's evil, and there's evil in the world, you know it's evil. Don't need anyone to tell you that it's... When it's impure, you know it's impure. But when it looks like gold... That's when you have to be careful. Why? Because sometimes people don't realize that a blessing can be a curse. The guy just won the lotto, but he doesn't realize that the rest of his life is going to be ruined. So therefore, the biggest, most dangerous yetzerah for many people could be money. Because the the Gemara says, money can even be a bigger yetzerah than women. Because if he gives a, he gets a hundred, what does he want? Two hundred. Get give him two hundred. How much does he want? Four hundred. But if you give him one wife, how much does he want? Doesn't say two wives. Sometimes he doesn't even want one. But the hundred, he wants two hundred. Two hundred, he wants four hundred. Meaning, as soon as he puts the four hundred in his pocket, already the other pocket is crying that he doesn't also have four hundred. There's always a desire for more gold, more money. So it's important for a person to know what's a blessing and what's a curse. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 58, says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is rebuking the people. This whole chapter really is, we, we should do a shiur just on this, on this whole chapter. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is doing a rebuke through the prophet. He's telling people that their religiosity is fake. Why? They were fasting. But who needs these fasts? Not because the fast is no good. Because they went to a day of fast. Yom Kippur. Rab Schwab used this as his Yom Kippur Drasha. This whole chapter. Says they came on Yom Kippur to go fast. Instead of fasting, they saw each other and say, Hey, hey, you owe me five hundred dollars. You better pay me. You, oh, you cut me off. Ta, punch him in the face. On a day of fasting, instead of fasting to Akadosh Bahu and getting close to Akadosh Bahu, they started running into a bunch of people they haven't seen in a long time. And they started closing accounts with people. She says, this is the type of fast, this is the type of religious that you have. If you want to know that I have accepted your tshuva, I have accepted your repentance, I'll give you a sign. What is this sign? The sign is that I'm going to give you an opportunity to shut down fences. Breaches. Breaches that have been broken for a few generations. 
Because usually, a person that does not grow up in a house of Torah, or is not keeping Torah, it's not because he started not keeping. Usually it started already before him. Usually it's his parents, they weren't keeping, or his grandparents already stopped. Or like somebody told me a few days ago that she came from intermarriage, her father is not Jewish, but her mom is Jewish, so technically, halachically, she's Jewish, but she followed in the footsteps of her mom. She also married a non-Jew, and after marrying the non-Jew for eight years, she suffered enough, and she broke up the marriage, but now she's doing tshuva ba'uch Hashem. But where did this breach start? I mean, it didn't start with her. And it didn't even start with her mom. Because her mom only married the non-Jew, because obviously her parents already did something to get her to think that it's okay to, to be intermarried. So any Jew that you see in the world that is living a non-religious life, he didn't start it all. Somebody else before him started it. That means they have a bill. It's a very big bill already. There's a broken chain already from a generation or two or three ago. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to give you an opportunity not only to fix your mistakes that you've made in your life, your Chilul Shabbat, your uh, desecration of God's name, your wasting seed, your idolatry. I'm not only going to give you that. I'm going to give you an opportunity to fix the broken breaches from the previous generations. Your grandfather. You're going to be able to fix it. Your grandmother. You're going to be able to fix it. That's the sign. How can you fix it? How can you fix it? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that these breaches that were broken, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, it's really three dapim, talk about it over there in a row, 40, 54, 55, 56. One of the reasons why there's broken breaches that also destroyed the Bet HaMikdash is because people saw their fellow Jew doing things against the Torah and they didn't speak against it. He saw the guy driving on Shabbat, he didn't say nothing. So much so, that one of my Talmidim told me today, he heard the rabbi of the Keilah Come and tell his own father. You're allowed to drive on Shabbat as long as you come to synagogue. And he considered himself Orthodox rabbi. Even reform he's not. Because at least they don't deny it. Reality is, a community that sees such a thing not only they should fire this rabbi, they should publicize what this rabbi does. But unfortunately, that would mean every community almost. So when there's no rebuke, that means people start thinking that it's okay to sin. There's a broken fence. At the time of the Khatam Sofer. Khatam Sofer, even though it was Ashkenazi, he him that you're not allowed to wear a wig. Even though at the time the wigs looked worse than your broomstick. One woman didn't care about what the Khatam Sofer said. She put on a wig. Shortly thereafter she died. The Khatam Sofer was told that she died. He said, when you bring her body to go bury her, Passed by my house. They brought the body, passed by his house. He came, the Rav, Khatam Sufer, came out of the house, lifted the, what was covering her face, and spit in her face. He says, and he said out loud, a pasuk from the Torah says, this is the punishment that you get for breaking the fence. You broke the fence. 
Why? The rabbi said no. You said yes. You broke the fence. Today we can't barely even say things like this. You're considered extreme. The fence has been broken so much that in Eretz Yisrael, Arab Sternbach just came out with a heavy rebuke on the religious community, or at least they can they consider themselves religious. One of the communities in Eretz Yisrael, I think it was in Bet Shemesh, where they had a woman come to the bima and roll the to- Sefer Torah. The woman was rolling the Sefer Torah. But they consider themselves Haridim. Not talking about their reform. But the woman came to roll the Torah. Baruch Hashem, at least we have somebody that's willing to rebuke. So one of the reasons why there's broken fences is not because of the sin itself, but rather because no one says anything. Second reason is, there's broken fences, is it simply a generational test. It's a test of the generation. At the time of the Bet Mikdash, the first one, there was a incomprehensible test with idol worship. HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed certain idols to have, literally, the ability to do things. Like at the time of Egypt. If you ever ask yourself, was Egypt surrounded by fences? The answer is no. So why didn't the Jewish people run away? Because the alarm system of the Egyptians was witchcraft, where these huge statues that had the body of of people, but the face of dogs, would bark and make noise. So everybody was afraid to move. Nobody ran away. You see a giant mountain start talking, what are you going to do? There's a generational test. There's generational tests in the 1100 with lending money with interest until the pogrom started because of it. Generational test, the time of the Holocaust, where you saw the vast majority of the German Jews convert to Christianity and Catholicism. One of the historians that writes about it says, yeah, but everybody talks about the Germans, Germans, German Jews. Okay, they became reformed, they became uh, all types of things, but that was only a fraction of the amount of Jews that get killed. Because there was 10 times more Jews in Poland and Russia. And they got murdered also though. And many of them, most of them were religious. So there's generational tests, whether it's business or it's a idolatry, different things. Akadosh Baruch Hu will allow a person to bring back those fences, put them back together. How? By putting a person in a position to do zikwe rabim. To do what we call in English Kiruv. Because by doing Kiruv, by doing Zikui Rabim, a person can not only fix himself, he can fix others. But when does a Kadosh Bahu decide to give somebody the actual success? Many people are doing Kiruv. A month doesn't pass by and uh, some, uh, some person tells me, listen, I want to work for the organization, I want to do Kiruv. Some want to work for free, some want to work for a salary. Nine out of ten we don't even consider, it's just simply because what they want and what we do is two different things. And you see some people, they do, they do, they give lectures, they, I don't know, they pass out cards, whatever they do. But you see that a lot of it doesn't work. But sometimes you see this one guy, Shines like the sun. Doesn't matter what he does. He can give people cups. They do tshuva. He speaks, a, gives a shiur Torah with broken English. Five people do tshuva. Ten people do tshuva. People start crying in the crowd. Another guy could know half the shas by heart. 
Nobody's changing. Why? Why does this one guy have such fortune, such a blessing, and the other guy, I mean, logically it would make sense if he actually has the blessing. That's because in order to get the greatest blessing of all blessings, a person has to pass a test. And the prophet says, ancient ruins will be rebuilt through you and you will restore generations, old foundations. You will have the ability to change the fortune of the previous generations. Ones that have been ruined. They went off the derech, they converted, they did all types of horrible things. You will get a blessing that will be able to not only fix your life, theirs too. They will, kill, they will, they will call you what HaKadosh Baruch Hu calls you. What does HaKadosh Baruch Hu call you? Goder Peretz. You want the blessing of Goder Peretz. What's Goder Peretz? Goder Peretz is the repairer of the breach. The repair of the breach and the restorer of the path of habitation. So the prophet tells you, you want the blessing of being Goder Peretz. Why do you want the blessing of Goder Peretz? Because you want to help people do tshuva. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm only going to make it work if you pass the test. What's the test? I'm going to throw at you different broken fences. Different breaches that have been broken already for generations. You fight to put back that fence and I'll allow the words or whatever acts you do to turn the reshaim into tzaddikim. I won't make anybody just because he's a good speaker help people transform their life. A lot of people are good speakers. Some of the biggest reshaim in the world are great speakers. Fantastic speakers. But even if they were reading the Torah of Mount Sinai, they wouldn't be able to move a single person in the crowd. They can't move themselves. They're like a corpse. Why? Because success that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you is not yours. He gives it to you. But in order to have that ability that Rashi brings from the Targum Yonatan, he says, what is this restore of the path of habitations? The Mesovev Netivot Lashavet. That is turning the Reshaim, the wicked, wicked people, back to Hashem. Bringing them back. Making them Sadiqim. So Kedosh Baruch says, I'll give you a test. I'm going to throw the fences at you. Whether it's the fence that was broken with wigs, or the fence that was broken with dishonest business, or the fence that was broken with uh, lending money with interest, or the fence that was broken with idol worship that's uh, accepted in communities and they bring missionaries to the Keila, or the fence that was broken with this, or the fence that was broken with that, or the fence with Chilul Shabbat, or the fence with Chilul Hashem, or the fence that was wasting seed, or the fence with uh, all types of adultery. I'm going to bring you those fences in front of you. It's going to show up at your shul, it's going to show up in your community. What are you going to do about it? If you don't do anything about it, then you're part of the broken fence. You're part of the broken fence. You want me to allow you to bring my kids back? You're one of the Rashaim yourself. Why? The Gemara in Yerushalmi, Masechet Ketubot, section 13, Allah number 1, says, the corruption of the sinners is attributed to the person who doesn't say anything. You see people mechalel Shabbat, you see people dishonest in business, you see people doing all types of things against Hashem, and you don't do anything about it? 
You're part of the problem. You're the community leader, you're on the board, you're a gvir, you're giving money, you're a rabbi, you're whatever you are. You have a position of some kind. And you sit there quietly, why? You don't want to disturb your uh, peace. The Gemara says, all of the sins that they're doing goes to your account also. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give you an opportunity. He brought in front of you a broken fence. You're like, oh, why do I have these problems? Chas v'shalom to say that. He gave you those problems as a gift. He brought you a heretic rabbi as a gift. He brought you Mechale Shabbat as a gift. He brought you Chilul Hashem when they're bringing missionaries to the shul as a gift. Why is a gift? Because if you know what to do, to speak out against it, to cry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to cry to Am Yisrael, this is a broken fence, then guess what? From that point on, your words are like HaKadosh Baruch Hu said it. People are going to hear it, people are going to change. And that's the gift of all gifts. Why? Because that's not only going to fix your own broken past, your own chilul Hashem, your own desecration of, of, of Shabbat and all of the things that you did yourself, but that's also going to fix your Saba and your Safta and your Saba, Saba, Safta and whoever started the broken chain at some point. It's not a coincidence that right before the shiul, Sonny told me about two people I never heard of in my life, even though I know him for almost a decade. That we have to do a shiul for Elu Nishma because he doesn't think that anybody ever did a shiul for their Elu Nishma. Apparently, it doesn't seem like they were the most religious people in the world. But today, they got a shiul dedicated to their Nishma. In Shemaim, they're dancing because they have a shiul for them. Why did they get such a merit? If there were tzaddikim, it would say after their name, Zecher Tzaddik Livracha. But it doesn't say that. But do you know why they got the benefit of having a shiul dedicated to their name? Because you're inside a house of, of people that have been involved with Zikuy Rabim for several years already. So part of the reward of doing this is a Kadosh who says, okay, you fixed, you're, you're, you're fixing, you fixed, you did a lot of good stuff. Now it's part two. Now I'm going to help you fix the past. Where the chain broke. Where the chain broke 50, 100 years ago, it broke. Because you're already at, you're doing what you're supposed to do. You spoke out against the lies. You were part of publicizing all the, all the truth that's out there. Now you get a gift. What's the gift? It's not just fixing yourself. It's not just having tzaddikim kids in a beautiful house. No, that's nothing. Now you're able to fix something you didn't even realize is fixable. This is why HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, look at how great my gifts are. Look at how great my blessings are. Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov did something good several thousand years ago. They're still getting paid for it till this day. And you want to miss out on it by not following the Torah. That's why the curses are so bad. When you get to the curses, the curses are horrible. Why are they so bad? When you reject such a great gift, you deserve a curse like that. When somebody is married to a righteous woman and she takes care of herself and she prepares herself and it's mikveh night and she took care of the kids and the kids are sleeping or they're at the in-laws or somewhere and there's food and there's this and everything is ready and she's excited to see her husband she is literally giving herself to her husband. And the husband comes home. He says, eh, 
Why are you here? No, I'm going to go out with my friends to a bar. There's a game. There's a game. There's a super, uh, super paw. Super something. Super dogs. Pikachu's on TV. We have to go drink beer until we get stupider. So, I'll take a rain check on this. The next day he comes home after he sobered up and instead of seeing his wife and kids, there's a lawyer in the house with divorce papers. Are you surprised? Do you feel bad for him? No. He deserves everything he got. The gift was the greatest gift in the world. Was being offered to you on a silver platter. And where'd you go? You went to a broken sister in some hole in the middle of the desert looking for water when you had an entire river. The blessings of the Torah are so beautiful. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you reject this, you deserve the curse. And that's why Rabotai and Karim, it's important for us to know the curses. But sometimes we also have to be reminded of the blessings. Because the blessings, the blessings are things that we can actually literally grab at will as often as you want. Just do what you're supposed to. And Be'ezat Hashem, this house, and this wonderful family will continue to get more and more blessings and more and more opportunities not only to be part of Kiruv and sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name, but also to continue to fix the broken parts of the chain. Wherever they broke, whenever they broke, and Be'ezat Hashem, each and every single one of us will be able to do the same and more. So, with that being said, you guys can start asking some questions, and then after you finish, we'll go to some of our friends that are still with us and not terrorists on the internet. Chavod, who wants to start? You said you had a question before, one of you, unless I answered it already. Could a Kohen school ever call itself religious? Repeat that again. Co-ed school ever call itself religious? Co-ed school call itself religious. If it's a co-ed school for kids that are under three years old, then there's no problem because they're three years old. But if you're talking about co-ed school like for you know teenagers uh, being a uh, co-ed, if the kids, if there is both boys and girls in the class, it's against the Torah. It's against the Torah. It's, there's no, uh, there's no, nothing religious about it. Even if they're learning Chumash Rashi from uh, nine to five, it's still a bizayon of the Torah, and uh, there's no, uh, no gadol ever permitted such a thing. Number one, because it leads to a uh, uh, immorality. Number two, it's because it's going against the uh, the, the words of the sages. Number three is because people are forgetting the obligation of people and they're putting people in the same caliber like the Goim are doing now. And unfortunately some Jews are doing now, which is they're giving everybody the same role. Meaning, no one has a job anymore. No one has a purpose anymore. Everyone can just pick whatever they want. So the guy is, has the same role as the girl. And the girl has the same role as the guy. And the reality is the obligation of learning to lies on boys, not on girls. But when people forget that, they say, no, no, the girls have a right to learn Torah too. They have a right to it, but not an obligation. When you treat a right to learn Torah as an obligation to learn Torah, and therefore you decide that putting boys and girls in the same class, that you forgot what the point is. The guy has an obligation to learn Torah. The girl should... But she has no obligation to learn Torah. She just needs to fulfill the basics of mitzvot. Why? She has to know enough to raise a family. That's it. She doesn't need to know, she doesn't need, she doesn't need to be Rashi. She doesn't need to be Gdola Adola. 
doesn't need to be any, any, she doesn't need to be a Rebetzin. She needs to be a kosher Jew. That's it. But when you put her and the boy in the same class, you're in essence saying that her Torah and his Torah are in the same level. And it's not true. Certainly they should both learn. Certainly it's good for them to learn. But one is an obligation and one is not. And when they have co-ed schools, they completely throw that into the, into the garbage. And they say, no, the obligation on both is the same. And it's wrong. That's the same concept of what they're doing in the world today. Where they're saying the he can be a she and she can be a he and all these other types of things. People simply want to do whatever they want. Whatever they want, whenever they want. And that's a very serious problem. But it also works in a... Sometimes you see it in the Jewish world even from people that are trying to do the right thing, if they don't have a rabbi to, to direct them and tell them where to go and what to do, there's, it, it's very easy for a person to go and make mistakes. I'll give you an example. There was a guy at the time of the Chafetz Chaim, well-to-do business guy, made a lot of money, and he was making a lot of money. One day he decided that he's going to not focus on business anymore. He's going to become an avrech. Learn Torah nonstop. Now, of course, if you don't work anymore, the money doesn't come in. So he wasn't able to continue giving the same level of tzedakah and chesed and so on, but he was able to learn Torah better than Avrachim and Akolel. On Yom Kippur, everyone went home during the afternoon. There's a break for usually about an hour hour, hour and a half. Everyone went home. He stayed in the shul. Reen Taylim. Reen Taylim. Not enough that he prayed all morning already for the last six, seven hours. Even during the break, he's reading Taylim. The Chafetz Chaim also stayed in shul. Chafetz Chaim walks up to him. And he reads, says, oh, oh, for the love. Yeah, yeah. It's good, right? Chafetz Chaim says to him, I don't think that's going to help you in Gainom. What? He's looking, maybe somebody's behind him. Who's he talking to? Me? What do I do? I'm, I'm, I'm really trading him. This is, not, this is not newspaper. Yeah, yeah. You're a traitor. Traitors do not go to Ganadin. Traitors? Me, a traitor? What did I do? Shalom, tell me, please. I'll fix it. He says, let me ask you something. You were a soldier a long time ago, right? Yes. In those days, everyone was a soldier at some point. The Stipe Lagoon was a soldier in the Russian army, Machshimam, so he became deaf in one of his ears. In those days, they would take little six, eight-year-old Jewish boys put him in the Russian army for the next 25 years. It's literally like death penalty. Either real death penalty or physical death penalty. I guess you read about what happened, Russian Jewry, Shemish Movi Atzil, 100 years ago, even less. Anyway, Chafetz Chaim says to him, when you were a soldier, let's say you were one of the guys in the taking care of the uh, planes. It's an important job. Plane doesn't fly. We're finished. Well, let's say you're the guy that's repairing the weapons. Very important job. If you don't fix the weapon, it breaks, doesn't shoot, it lead to a lot of people dying. Right? Can you just decide one day you don't want to be the guy that's fixing the weapons anymore? You're going to join the battalion that's in charge of the tanks. Can you just show up there? The guy says, no, of course not. Why would I? Why? Why not? No, you can't. You, 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 have, you have a job. You can't just go. He goes, well, what would happen if you did? What would happen if you just decide not to go fix weapons that day? Just go and fix and, and go and be one of the drivers for the tanks. Just what would happen is that uh, they will put me in jail. No, no, but let's say you were good with the tank. You went in a tank and you shot. Boom, and the guy died. Boom, and he died. Everybody died. Are you going to get a reward? 
Because no, you're going to go to jail. But you shot the tank. It doesn't make a difference. Why not? Because that's not your job. You can't just go in the army. Chafetz Chaim says to him, and that's where you're going to go to Gehenom. Akadosh Baruch Hu gave you a job. He made you good at business. You're good at making money. Instead of making money and investing into the world of Torah, helping the tzaddikim, helping the kolel, helping all those people. What are you doing? Oh, you decide to be an avrech. All of a sudden you want to be the next dolado. Who gave you the right to do that? Who gave you permission to do that? Who told you to go become a rabbi? That's not your role. You're the guy that fixes weapons. You're going to shoot tanks. You're committing treason. And for that, you're going to go to Gainom. The guy starts crying hysterical. He goes, I didn't know. I didn't know. Can I fix it? He goes, today is your day to fix it. Today is your day to fix it. The whole day obviously changed. The Yom Kippur changed. And after Yom Kippur changed. Sure, he has to learn Torah. But who says become an avrech and uh, learn all day, all night? If your gift is making money, go make money and learn some Torah and invest that money in Torah. But if your gift is learning Torah, you go into business, you're also committing treason. Every person has to know what their role is. Every person has to know what their role is. When you don't know what your role is, you have to have a Talmud Chacham tell you which direction. He has to know who you are, when you are... But when a person just decides, no, no, you know what? I made enough money, so I'm just going to... Uh, who says you're allowed? Who says you're allowed to retire? Well, I already worked for 30 years. So what? Maybe it's the worst to work until you die. Maybe not. Maybe you work too much. You have to have a Talmud Chacham tell you. But that's the problem in society today. Everyone wants whatever role they want. He wants to be he, she wants to be a it, that wants to want this, everyone wants to be whatever they want. And that's where the whole, it all starts with the mentality that boys and girls should learn together because it's the oblig- it's, obligation is the same. It all starts from that. That's where the fence broke. The fence broke there. And now you have one of the so-called leading comedians in the from world celebrates with a bunch, of, a bunch of LGBTQ friends of his, Shabbat, on video. He uh, does Kiddush for all of his boyfriends. You see, I don't know, 30, 40 guys pretending to be girls. And he's doing Kiddush with them. He's saying a bracha. And his husband is wearing a bra. And this Chamor, Modi, his name is, Shem Rashaim Yerkav, he says, this is Mashiach energy. This is Mashiach energy. It's Kafakela energy. Seven chamber of Gehenom energy. Toivat Hashem energy. Go'an Nefesh energy. Everything but not Mashiach energy. Why? Because the Mashiach, Mashiach Tzidkenu, it says, Uba letzion goel, eshave pesha beyaakov. Maze uba letzion goel, eshave What is this? What does that mean? We say it in our prayer. Uba letzion goel. The goel, the Mashiach, is coming. Where is he coming? Where is he coming? Leshave pesha beyaakov. To go. And save all of the people that used to be Poshaim, all the people that used to be Reshaim, all the people that used to be Mechale Shabbat, LGBTQ, all the people that are praying the wrong role. He's, they used to be, they did Shuva, he's going to save them. But if you're still a Poshaya, if you're still a criminal, he's not going to save you. But rather, Beruach Piv Yamit Rasha. But on those people it says, the Mashiach, with the words, with the air that comes out of his mouth, he'll kill the wicked.
But that's what happens in society. A small broken chain. He and she have the same role in life. Same obligation. Two generations later, they've exchanged. He is a she. She is a he. Everything is a it. So, while people don't think it's a big deal, they don't realize that the root of all of the evil that's in the world today started with what seems to be innocent innocent steps that are perhaps not the tradition, but they're not so far away. The road to Gehenom is full of innocent steps. That's where we have Chachamim. They tell us right, they tell us left. Even if what they say is clearly wrong to us, the Torah Tosha tells us you still do it. They tell you left. When you know it's right, you still go left. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu will make whatever they say right just because they're his representatives. But when you decide you know better than the Chachamim, You've gone against Hashem, you've gone against the Chachamim, you've gone against the Torah, you've gone against everything, and you don't think it's a big deal. It's a small little broken link. Once it's a broken link, you need, you know how many schuyot you need to fix it? But this Rasha, he's invited, this Modi guy, he's invited to yeshivot, to Shabbatons, to be at Orthodox synagogues, uh, modern Orthodox synagogues, I don't know, all types of things. And he's not private about it. He talks about it every day. He's proud about this thing, that he's married to a guy. And he's, he's, not, like, he's not one of these people that's in the closet. Like when I was a kid, when you had a spiritual deformity, you hid it. He's proud. Proud as can be. As if it's normal. You're not normal for, for looking at me that way, for thinking it's not normal. Why? Because he says, Mashiach energy. Mashiach energy. Genom energy is not even enough to punish these people. But it's not even his fault. It's not solely his fault. Why? The chain broke before him. And all of those people that invite him to the synagogues, that invite him to the yeshivot, that invite him to the, the Shabbatons, all of the people that attend this show, Jews and Gentiles, they're all going to take a piece of the punishment. Every single one of them with no exception. Why? When somebody publicly desecrates the name of a Kadosh Baruch Hu and says what's allowed is, a, is, is not allowed and what's not allowed is allowed, you publicize something that's against a Kadosh Baruch Hu with such zeal, with such pride, Every single person that's involved in it will get punished to no end. Oh, I didn't know. It was your job to know. It was your job to know. But that's what's happening. So this question may seem like, a, eh, what's the big deal? But you see, it all starts. It all starts with a small little broken link. And it develops to something much, much bigger. In the Jewish religion, there's no such thing as no big deal. As you saw, somebody that was perhaps the next, next door neighbor to Avraham Avinu. Next door neighbor to Avraham Avinu. He sees Avraham Avinu cutting his foreskin, doing Brit Milah. What does he think? He thinks Avraham Avinu is sick in the head. He thinks Avraham Avinu, something's wrong with him. He doesn't think Avraham Avinu is tzaddik. He doesn't think Avraham Avinu is kadosh. He thinks Avraham Avinu is something wrong with him. That's what he thinks. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? Then he starts seeing Avraham Avinu do it to all the people. All of his slaves. Anybody who was in his house had to do it. Does it to his 13 year old son, Ishmael. What are you doing? You're abusive. You're abusing people. What's wrong with you? That's what he thinks. Why? Because he's looking at it from his perspective. He's not looking at it from a Torah perspective. So from his perspective, when you look at things from your perspective, you're bound to be wrong. When you look at things from a Torah perspective, you have God telling you what to do. 
It doesn't, it doesn't get more right than that. But when you go and take God's words and manipulate them to fit your own agenda, there's nothing worse than that. You're worse than even the guy that thought that Abraham Avinu was crazy. At least he has an excuse. He simply doesn't know anything. He's looking at it from a logical perspective. But when you went into the book of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you said, ah, there's 613 commandments, so what if you violate one? So what? So what if you take Hashem's name and you throw it? So what? There's nothing worse in the world. Nothing worse than that. And every single person that's involved in it, Jew, Gentile, it could be a dog that's involved in publicizing things that are against the Kadosh Baruch Hu, there will be no end to their suffering. Genom will end, and their suffering will not. And there's no mercy on such people. The only mercy that exists is when I say harsh words like this, hopefully, hopefully, it's enough to wake up their sleeping soul and make them realize, I have to change. Soft doesn't work. Why? Because you have to burn fire with fire. Their fire of lust that's leading them to make all of those decisions to do things that are against Hashem, you can't turn it off with sweet talk. Oh, Tadiq, why don't you leave your husband? It's not appropriate for you. Let me, let me find you a nice tzarai menu for you. Let me find you a nice lady. Be a nice, you know, Yiddish guy. No, it's not going to work. Why? He's going to tell him, Nah, what are you talking about? I love him. He's the love of my life, he's going to tell you. Yeah, but he's a he and you're a he. If you had two fathers, you wouldn't be here. Love not going to work. Sweet talk's not going to work. That's why the Gemara says there's multiple types of fire. There's the fire that you see when you turn on a match and you turn on the stove. Like Baomer, you see. But then there's higher levels of fire. There's green fire, there's blue fire, there's the fire of the Shekhinah that Eliyahu and Avi brought to this world that would burn not only the Kobanot, but it burned the, uh, the ground, it burned the water, it burned everything in sight. There's divine fire. That's the only type of fire that can take these people from wherever they are to where they need to be. The fire of truth. That's what works. And as much as people say, oh, I, it shouldn't be this way, it should be nice, nice doesn't work. Why? Because the lust, the tava of lust is fire. It's fire. It's, it's, you tell a guy, listen, get rid of her. What do you mean? I already paid a thousand dollars. I'm not going to get rid of her. I'll do tshuva tomorrow. Listen, I'll give you a thousand dollars. You're not going to get rid of nothing. What? The tava is not going to let He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. Only thing that's going to make him do it is a fire, fire of Torah. Nothing else. This is why this works and helps people do tshuva. Every single shiul, even the people that have been watching me for 10 years, they continue watching. Every shiul they do more tshuva. Has nothing to do with me. Has to do simply with what I say. This Torah. Anybody else do it? You guys say the same thing, you'll do the same thing. Whereas somebody else they can give you all of the intricate details of how to build a spaceship. Won't help. They can tell you whatever they want. Won't help. They can tell you who nice, they can be the nicest person in the world. Not going to help. I know there's unfortunate. There was a, actually a, uh, a famous uh, writer in Eretz Yisrael that just wrote an article about it and says that there's a, uh, right now, he's publicly rebuking all of these Rabbis that are Kiruv rabbis, but in a nice way. He says, it doesn't work. He says, these people, you get them to keep a couple of mitzvot, and you think that you did good, it doesn't work. Why? He still stayed with his girlfriend. She still stayed with her boyfriend. They're still not modest. They're, you know, 
They think that uh, everything is lovey-dovey and they turn God into some type of grandfather with, uh, that hugs you and loves you no matter what. Because it's not, not, not shuvah. Finally, when you have an opportunity to help somebody, that's, you, can't, you can't do that to them. If you do that to them, it's better off you didn't do anything. Why? Because somebody else would have given the, given the opportunity. But that's unfortunately what's happening. So it's, a, it's important for a person to know what the truth is and to use his special neshama to make the right decision. What he decides, what he doesn't decide, is not your problem. Your problem is that at the very least you give him the opportunity to decide with the right information. All of those schools, all of those rabbis, all of those parents that contribute to these schools, that are co-ed, co-ed university, co-ed yeshiva, co-ed this, co-ed that, all of them are going to get punished. And I'm not just talking about Ganon. In this world, how the kids grow up, how the kids don't want to be religious anymore. How the kids want to be intermarried. All of this stuff. You know, the Moshe Mendelssohn, Shem Rashaim Yerkav. He was religious. He didn't tell people to convert to Christianity. He just told people, be religious in your house and a regular person outside. Every single one of his kids, except one, converted to Christianity, became idol worshiper. Every single one. You're never going to find Moshe Mendel telling you, go to Christianity. But his breaking of the fence, every single one of his kids, I think he had 10 kids, 10, 11 kids. Every one of them became an idol worshiper. You saw him in the street today, you think he's a from rabbi. What do you mean? He's orthodox, Haredi. You wouldn't think he's a reformer. When Rabbi Israel Misalant heard that his son left the community to go learn medicine and become a doctor, Rabbi Israel Misalant sat Shiva on his son. Went on the floor, started crying like his son died. Not because he's against medicine. Chazanish was helping people with surgeries left and right just because of his wisdom of Torah. There's a whole books and books written about medicine. But he knew that he didn't do it because he wants to be uh, a doctor for the sake of helping people. He wants to be a doctor for the sake of, you know, joining the world. Leaving the past, leaving the tradition, leaving the Masoret. When people do these things, and they start adding names to Judaism. Modern Orthodoxy, Reform, Conservative, Open, Closed, this, that, all these different things. These are simply breaking chains, breaking the chain of the Torah. And once a person breaks the chain, there's no end. There's no end to that. And unfortunately, it says the, the, the damage is uh, noticeable in society. Next question. Yeah. So a person that's not a consider themselves a good um, communicator or they're just a new person in the community what materials or what can they be empowered with to help the community I don't know, um, to keep the basic and give them, uh, the, it's not even a matter of as far as the question is what is a person that's not a good community to do to help people get closer to Hashem to do Kiru, to do Zikri al to be part of this whole thing it's not even a matter of whether someone is a good communicator or not. The vast majority of people should not be public speakers. Number one, because it is a specific skill set. Not just a skill set to speak, but how to speak. And what to say. When to say it. To whom to say it. Sometimes I have people that tell me, Oh yeah, listen, my mom told me that uh, we should do this. And I yelled at her and I rebuked her and I this and I... Go apologize. What? What do you mean apologize? I told her. I t- go apologize to your mom right now. Go cry to your mom. Go cry to your mom on your, on your knees. Cry to your mom if you can. What do you mean? But she was doing this. I said, go cry to your mom. Chamo. Go, you chamo. What are you doing yelling at your mom? Who said you're allowed to yell at your mom? No, but she was doing this, she was doing that. Okay, she could do this, she could do that. Even if your mom is a prostitute, you're not allowed to yell at her. Who 
Who says you're allowed to? Who, who, you chamo? Who, where'd you learn this from? I learned it from you. I never said that. You think I said that. Because you're interpreting things your own way. Most people should never be people that rebuke people and tell people anything. What should they do? They should give material. Give USBs, give CDs, give books, arrange lectures, raise money from people. Listen, as a good organization, maybe you contribute 100, 200, 500, get it from 10, 20 people. Before you know it, you raise 5,000 a week. Everybody has somebody that they know. Especially if you're part of a Jewish community, everybody has 5, 10, 20, 30 people. You know some co-workers. Some people. They don't have to be well-to-do. Oh no, I don't know anybody rich. Who says you need to know somebody rich? Do you know that our organization almost has nobody that's rich, that's a donor? I honestly don't even think we have anybody that's rich. But there's a few people that Baruch Hashem donate a little more than others. But I don't think that they're like multi-millionaires or anything like that. There's a few people that will donate the $15,000 for the campaign right now, but that doesn't make them rich. Just, they're okay. People think that you need to be like a billionaire to donate. The vast majority of people that donate to our organization are regular average people. They'll donate 100 a week, 100 a month, 500 a month, whatever they can do. But the people that are real, they do it on a regular basis. They do it on a regular basis. Not like, oh, well, yeah, it's uh, one state. No, no, they do it on a regular basis. And guess what? The everybody knows other people. You have a brother, you have a sister, you have a coworker, you have somebody. Don't wait for rich people. Don't wait for rich people. They have a pulse. They have a bank account. They don't even need a bank account. Literally. They work. They have food to eat. They have a little extra. 50, 100, 200, 500. You do that with 5, 10 people a week. Guess what? You can become a cure of machine. You take that four, five, six thousand dollars every single week. You donate it. We publish more CDs, more USBs, more books, more shulim, more events, more avrichim, more Torah, more this. Guess what? All of it goes to you. Even more than them. Why? Gadola me'asem inaose, says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Someone that enables other people to do mitzvot gets even a greater reward than the person actually did it. You, the most you have to give is 200 bucks a month. That's the most you have. But you have an extra little time every day between Mincha and Arvit, between, uh, you know, uh, different things that you're doing. You go to a few people in the community, say, listen, I'm part of this organization. I want to help people do tshuva. I want to help people learn more Torah. I want to do this. What can you help us with? Oh, but you came last month. Yeah, last month was last month. Last month we ate. Last month we drank. It ran out. We have to continue eating. We have to continue doing. What can you do this month? Okay, okay, fine. I'll give you a hundred. Okay, thank you very much. See you next month. See you next week. See you next campaign. See you by the time you forget me. Or by the time I forget, you know, I think that you forget me. You go to the next guy. Listen, you want to help people do tshuva. You want to help people. I want to, I want to give you a schut. I love you so much, I want to give you a schut. What's a schut? I want to get you another 310 worlds in Olam Abba. Oh, sure. How can I do that? What can contribute? What can contribute? 100, 500, 1,000. What can you contribute? Guess what? You do this with 5, 10 people. You can easily raise a few thousand dollars every single month. We take that money and we make people do tshuva with it. We make people learn Torah with it. One of my friends asked me about this event that we're having in Eretz Yisrael. And I explained to him, the biggest expense is paying all of these tzaddikim. When we signed up for it, I didn't have the money ready. I still don't have the money ready. You guys look at the campaign. It's not like uh, earning... We didn't reach our target. Let's just say that. Or half our target. But there's no, you know, there's no, there's no concern here. Why? Because I know what we're doing as far as what we're trying to do, what we did. And Akadosh Baruch is going to do whatever he has to do. Now, most people, the way they do things is that, oh, first we have to raise the money, raise a million, then we have to set up, then everybody has to get their cut, he has to get himself a car, he has to get himself a new, firm. by the time you finish, maybe there's like 10-15% left, and that's for, that's for the actual you know, campaign. For us, it's the opposite. 
First, we there's what's needed to be done. There's families that need to eat. There's Torah that needs to be learned. Can we combine both? Bahu Hashem, we combine both. Yalla, let's go. Let's go spend a few hundred thousand dollars, half a million dollars on getting this thing done. Do you have the half a million dollars? No. But but they signed up for it. I signed up for it too. But what's going to happen if you're not going to have it? Why are you kufel? Why are you a heretic? No, I'm not a heretic. I'm just asking, what if you don't have it? Why are you saying I'm not going to have it? You gave it to me. Did you ever give me anything? Did I ask you to borrow money so I could pay my rent? Did I ask you to feed me? Did you put lungs in my, in my, in my lung? Did you put air in my lungs today? No. Who gave it that to me? Not you, right? So the same one that I went to for that is that what I'm going to for this. This means you have to exercise your emunah muscles. But it's not for your own interest. It's for the interest of the kids of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's for the Torah of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So that's the thing. If a person cares about Am Yisrael, cares about Torah, cares about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're not going to jump into the waters. But not everybody can just start that way. So that's why I'm saying every person can start with something minimal. They can distribute material. They can collect money from people. Go to family, friends, neighbors, people you know, people you don't know. Every person can easily raise a few thousand dollars every single month. I don't know why people wait for big campaigns to do this. You know, sometimes I see these organizations do campaigns. We need to raise, I don't know, a million and a half dollars, two million dollars in 24 hours. And they make these teams. They make these teams. Oh, this guy, he has a team. He has a team. He has a team. And you know, these teams raise money. If you care about what we do, don't wait for that type of thing. It's never going to happen. We don't have teams. We don't have time for teams. You want to go do it? Go do it now. But if you don't do it, don't cry when you go up to Shemaim and they tell you that you're half homeless. Why? Because that's what we said. That's what Rabbi Vaidya said in the story. That Syrian Jew that was a Talmud of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, it wasn't because he was, he was an Ashkenazi. He was Sephardic. His fellow Jews were also Sephardic. They didn't understand what Rabbi Moshe Feinstein said. But he had enough wisdom in him to tell them, listen, listen, you don't know who he is, but I know a little bit. And that's why I'm telling you, you're going to give this, you're going to give this, you're going to give this, you're going to give this. Why? You're going to thank me for it after. And guess what? All the thanks in the world is not enough for what he did for them. All the thanks in the world is not enough for what he did for them. So the people that perhaps are uncomfortable, oh, why didn't you come already last month? Oh, why are you asking me? This is uncomfortable. I like to give on my own. And you're a little pushy with them. Trust me when I tell you, you're doing them a favor. They're not doing you any favors. You're not doing any favors. Anybody that donates to our organization, they're not doing us any favors. They're doing a favor to themselves. We appreciate what everybody does, that they trust, that we are, we're good shlichim, and we're responsible for what we're doing, and we're going to help people with this money. And not pat our pockets. But the truth is, they're helping themselves. They're doing themselves a favor. That's what sometimes people tell me, listen, can you, uh, can you uh, uh, shut down my monthly donation? Sure. The end. Like, there's no argument. Why? Oh, I hope that nothing, zero. Why? I know you're in a bad situation right now. Not, not my financially. You're in a bad spiritual state. You just lost the biggest schut in your life. You were contributing a little bit of money to our organization. We were using that money to help people do tshuva. You just lost that schut. You're in a horrible position. Nothing I can say can help you. You have to earn it yourself. I can't give it to you. Oh, but why don't you convince them? Why is that time? I have to convince Jews to go back to, to, to go from Gainom to Ganeda. You think I have time to convince people with money? Oh, why don't you call my cousin? He's really rich. Who has time for this? Thing? Who has time for money? Who has time for this? I have time to spend money. Spend money on tzaddikim to go help them learn Torah. Spend money on publicizing a Baruch Hu's name. That's what I have time for. I have time to go collect money from people. Yeah, but how are you going to pay for it? He's going to pay for it. Just like I didn't ask him to put air in my lungs. 
I do not ask him to do anything else. I'm doing what he says. He's going to do the rest. The end. Now anyone that wants to be a part of it, but they don't have the same abilities and so on, like I said, everybody has somebody that they know. And usually it's more than somebody. You call that somebody, you tell them, listen, can you give, can you contribute? Okay, I'll give a hundred. Okay, great. Thank you very much for giving. But can you give me like three, four, five of your friends? Maybe they can give two. Usually if somebody gave you, they'll also want to want to give you a few people. And guess what? You'll end up getting even more from them. Why? Because you're going to call me. Hey, listen, uh, Steve told me about you. He just gave to our campaign. He just gave to the organization that we're raising money for. And he told me you're a good person to call. You're, you're a big tzaddik. You like to give. Well, how much you want to contribute? Guess what? It's very likely Steve will give you a thousand. Yeah, but his friend, uh, his friend only gave you a hundred. Can. But since you came now as a, as a friend, as a recommendation, sky's the limit. Same thing works in business. The guy that's your client can give you $100,000 in business. But his referral, at least a million. At least a million. Why? Because he's a referral. Already trust you. You broke the thing. You broke the ice. But everybody could do this. Why don't pe- most people do this? Ask them. Ask them. That's why... Kadosh Baruch Hu says, you have an opportunity to do mitzvot, collect mitzvot. Collect mitzvot. What else? Oh, wow. No? All right, let's see what our friends from TikTok have to say. Idol worshiper. Next. Uh, how were the tribes divided to ascend to Mount Gazim and Eval? That's in the Torah in this week's parasha. It gives you the exact names of each one uh, as according to what Hashem said. Six and six. Uh, next. Comment. No, a lot of comments. Not uh, what we give. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, how do you become a rabbi? How do you become a rabbi? It depends what kind of rabbi you want to be. There's different types of rabbis. If you're talking about a rabbi that's a speaker, you don't have to be a rabbi if you're a speaker. The Gemara in Masechet, Bab Metziah, page 31a, says, or 32a, says that uh, who is your rabbi? And there's an argument between three different sages. One says, that one that taught you all of the Torah. Another one, that's Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yossi says, no, it's someone that taught you most of the Torah that you know. Rabbi Meir says, no, no. It's whoever teaches you Torah, teaches Torah, he's your rabbi. Meaning, even if he's not, even if he didn't teach you all of the Torah, if he taught you, Anyone who teaches Torah, he's a rabbi. Meaning that as far as to be a rabbi, that's say, uh, uh, if you're teaching Torah, you're a rabbi. Now, as far as whether to call yourself a rabbi or not, it all depends. Depends whether it's a, uh, you know, who you're teaching, your age, if your rabbi is okay with it. Meaning it depends on your position. But the point is, as far as the, to teach, you don't need to be a rabbi. In essence, the actual teaching itself makes you a rabbi. But as far as to use the title of rabbi or not, again, it depends for what purpose. If you're, you're going to use it for the sake of getting honor, then obviously don't do it. But if, uh, if there's a purpose for it, then there's, uh, again, it uh, uh, has to be determined by your rabbi. If you don't have a rabbi, then certainly you're not a rabbi because you don't know that you have an obligation to have somebody teach you in order for you to teach others. Now, there's also different types of rabbis. There's rabbis that are, their expertise is in shechita, slaughtering, or Tarat Mishpacha, or their Poskim, 
or uh, you know, there you know, there's different types of rabbis. Some rabbis don't speak to uh, most rabbis don't speak to a uh, the public. Uh, they may have some talmidim here and there, but they don't have like lectures and things like that. So again, it depends. But as far as the, the one common denominator among all rabbis is that you have to learn a lot of Torah. You have to make Torah learning your priority in life. More important than making money, more important than anything else you have in your life. doesn't mean that you're not allowed to make money, or you're not allowed to work. You're not, no, you're allowed to do everything. It's just that that's kosher. It's just that the priority number one is to learn Torah. Without learning Torah, certainly you're not going to be a good leader. You're not going to be a, a rabbi. Really, in essence, what a rabbi is is a teacher. It's a teacher. But usually when, when someone is a good rabbi, it's because they have a high level of Yilat Shabbat. They have a high fear of the Almighty, so they're afraid of making mistakes because they know that people's lives are on the line. So even simple questions uh, that, uh, that uh, to most people, they think, oh yeah, you should, why, you know, don't double check, just you know, throw an answer. So what's the big deal? So what if you're wrong? No, no, you don't understand. Small, minor error could lead to a lot of problems. Uh, and that's, that's a, so it's important for a person to have a lot of Yilat Shemaim in order to be a rabbi. And again, it's a, uh, it depends who the person is, what they're doing with it, why they're doing it, and so on. But the priority, number one, is to learn Torah. Uh, as far as what does it take, the biggest thing is to sacrifice. You know, the person has to sacrifice a lot of the uh, pleasures of this world that people chase after uh, and, and exchange that with, you know, number one, learning Torah. Number two, their, their time to, that they usually use for everything else, they have to use to help people. The more a person is willing to sac- sacrifice for the sake of others, to help others, the better they're going to be. Uh, the more they want to just benefit from it, they may you know, become a rabbi, but they're not going to be a good one. There's plenty of people that have the position of a rabbi, of a synagogue, of a community, of the internet, or whatever it is, but that in itself doesn't make them a good one. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the uh, things that the prophet Isaiah says in chapter uh, 1 uh, verse number 10 is that Kadosh Baruch rebuking all of these false leaders. All of these false leaders that were given the, uh, the pulpit, were given the role of leadership, but they were false leaders. They weren't doing it for the sake of heaven. They were doing it for the sake of uh, the bank account or reputation. Unfortunately, nothing has changed in the last couple of thousand years. There's plenty of people that uh, are still doing it for their pocket. So a person needs to know that if they want to be a good leader, a good rabbi, they have to have a, uh, they themselves have to have a good rabbi, they have to dedicate to the Torah, and they have to uh, make sure they, their priority is to help as many people as possible, not just uh, their own reputation and their own uh, uh, honor or pockets. That's it. Are tikkunim required for tshuva? Uh, required, no, but uh, they're certainly a help, meaning to do tshuva, a person needs to, number one, stop the sin. That's the number one thing. Stop the sin. Without stopping the sin, you haven't even begun tshuva. You haven't even begun tshuva. So somebody says, yeah, but why, why can't I just, uh, you know, give money? And that? No, no, you don't understand. If a person goes into a mikveh to purify himself, but at the same time he's holding a lizard or he's holding a pig in his hand, he could dip in the mikveh a million times. He's still impure. It's called tovel v'sheretz biyado. Someone is dipping in a mikveh, but there's something impure in his hands. He still stays impure. So until a person stops sinning, the specific sin that he wants to do tshuva for, like desecrating Shabbat, or wasting seed, or immorality, or whatever it is, until he stops, tshuva hasn't begun. Now, just because you stopped, doesn't necessarily mean that that's it, that's where it ends. Because many times, especially with the difficult sins, like lust and things like that, it takes a few tries, meaning you stop, and then you went back to it again, and you stop again, you went back to it again. It's like quitting smoking, or alcohol, or drugs, or a lot of other things. Usually most people don't have the wherewithal to stop cold turkey, and stop right away everything and never do it again. Most people usually need a couple of tries. So this doesn't give you permission to sin. It's just a reality. It's like sometimes when I meet you know, a couple, where one is a Jew and one is not Jewish, but they're serious about each other. They're married or they want to get married. And, uh, you know, and I know that this relationship is not going to break. They're not going to... Uh, they're intermarried. They're not allowed to be together. And according to Allah, they have to leave each other. 
Once the other guy, once the other person converts, then they marry each other if they want. But the reality is, they're not going to leave each other. They're not going to leave each other. And if you tell them, listen, you have to leave each other, and then once the other person converts, then you meet again in a year, two, five years from now, if you tell them that, you lost both of them. You lost both of them. Why? Because it's a reality. There's the halacha, but there's a reality. They're not going to follow it. So you have to, you know, walk between the uh, raindrops. And tell them outright, you're not allowed to be together. You know this. I'm never going to tell you you're allowed to be together. Every single time you're together, especially if you're together intimately, it's, it's a death penalty from Shemaim. Now, once you understand that, we can continue moving forward. But never think for a moment that just because I'm helping you, that means that I'm telling you it's okay for you guys to be together. You're not allowed to be together. But I also know that you're not going to leave each other. So because we're in this circumstance, I would like to help you. Eventually, for whichever one of you that needs to convert, to convert, the other one needs to do tshuva and so on. I'll help you. I'll do whatever I can to help you to, 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 to fix this situation. But it doesn't mean that you're allowed to be together. The fact that you're alive, either one of you, every single day is a miracle. The fact that Hashem allows you to live, to breathe more, every single day, when you were just together with each other, you slept in the same bed, is a miracle. And many people don't necessarily understand that. Sometimes they do, which is very good, but sometimes they don't. Or sometimes they understand the beginning and then they stop. And then all of a sudden, she was learning, everything was great, and all of a sudden you see her sitting down in a living room with uh, no arms and no legs. What happened to your modesty? Where did your modesty go in the garbage? Last week, you were in a shiur Torah, Rabbanit, ready to convert tomorrow. This week, you're walking around like you have no God. What happened to you? Oh no, but I was just, it was hot, and everybody else was like that. Okay, you don't, you're not understanding the magnitude of the crime here. Every single day that you're alive, while still going against God, it's a miracle you're alive. Miracle. Outright open miracle. No less than a splitting of the sea. And you're still playing games with him? You should be on a rocket ship up in spirituality, doing every single thing you know. To do, the, to do the will of Hashem and fast as possible. And you're playing games with them? Be surprising to me if you finish the year. But that's the thing. Sometimes people don't get this. And you talk to them like this, they get shocked. But sometimes that's what's necessary. Sometimes you have to talk to them softer. Depends on the person. But the key is to know that you have to be honest with people. You have to be honest with people. You can't let them live a lie and think that it's okay. Never ever kosher the pig. Never kosher the pig. Never tell them it's okay to keep Shabbat once a year or to be modest only sometimes or uh, all these times. Never. Why? Because once you kosher it one time, it's kosher forever. And that's what the Gemara Masechet Yomah says. The first time a person sins and he doesn't see a punishment, he does the sin again. If he doesn't see a punishment, it turns into a mitzvah. Making the sin turns into a mitzvah. He made the same sin twice, he doesn't think there's any punishment anymore. He's intimate with his non-Jewish girlfriend. Twice. He didn't get killed from Shemaim. He didn't lose all of his money. He didn't get cancer. He thinks it's allowed. It's no big deal. Shem doesn't care. So now you come and tell him, listen, you realize that you're alive. It's a miracle, right? You realize that the fact that she's alive and she didn't like get run over by a train on the way to your house. You know it's a miracle. Like, what are you talking about? Well, he's confused. How do you, why? Because for him, he's been making sins every single day for the last year. He thinks it's allowed. You have to bring him back to reality. Now listen, it's not allowed. And every single day is a miracle. So my recommendation is, don't play games. Do everything you're supposed to from this point on so we can get to the next step. She converts, you convert, whoever needs to convert, whoever needs to do tshuva, whatever you do, as soon as possible. Why? There's no promise of tomorrow. No promise of tomorrow. You want to play games? I highly recommend you watch my movie of my personal life story. It's called Hashem Took Back His Millions. And know that the truth is a hundred times worse than that story. That story is a soft kid version 
of the truth. Because the truth none of you can handle. Maybe he. Because he lived a little part of it. He knows what Gainon looks like. Rest of you guys know no. Why? Simply put, unless you cannot explain pain to people. Doctors don't know what pain is. So, when a person plays games with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they don't realize they're, how stupid they are. So you have to wake them up. Tell them, listen, I understand you're addicted, you're in bad shape, you're whatever you are, no problem. I'll help you, but don't waste my time. Once you see people wasting your time, give them a warning, two warnings. If they continue to do it, you got to move on. Why? There's too many people you need to help. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and just help one people, one couple, one this, and just do everything. Never do that. Why? Their blood is not, is not more red than anybody else. I've had family members call me, tell me, listen, call this person. He's your this, he's your that, he's your uncle, he's your brother, he's your this. I'm sorry, I can't. Why not? He's related to you. She's related to you. I said, listen, related, not related. Their blood is not redder than the rest of the people all over the world that I have to help. They're not getting phone calls. They're not getting phone calls. They want, I'll send them a text message, I'll send them like this, I'll, they, you know, different things, but they're not going to get this special treatment. And trust me when I tell you, anyone that ever got special treatment, the first sign that I knew that they're wasting my time, that was the last sign, the end. They usually get one warning, not more than that. Once there's a, there's a, they, I see a second time of wasting my time, it's, they're deleted and even, there's no second chance. Why? I'm very, very critical with that. I'm stricter than that than any of my shuvim. Why? Because I know that there is people that I can help. And when you waste my time, I believe you committed murder. You want to come meet me for absolutely no reason? In my perspective, your disrespect of, 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 of people that need to be helped is no different than committing murder. Why? Because I can use my time to help people do tshuva. What are you doing? What are you building companies? Good for you. Go build whatever you want. Go build an empire. I'm trying to build a generation. You want to help? Bechavod, you're welcome. But to ask for, for to, to, to allow myself to waste time is not possible. So anytime that I help people, I'm very critical about specific time and how I use my time. I'm very, you know, I get annoyed very quickly when it comes to uh, stuff like that. I tell somebody, listen, be here at one o'clock, call me at this time. Somebody doesn't do it. I'm as critical as possible. It's not because I'm some Nazi that I need to be so particular about everything. No, it's that because I know I have specific things to do. And if I'm not careful with my time, people are dying. I can make another shoe. I can help with another video. I can give more consulting to people. I can help save another marriage. Convince another couple that uh, they, they, they shouldn't commit an abortion. Uh, you know, there's a million and a half different things. If you guys saw my, my phone one day, literally, I think you get a, more, a tougher shear than watching Gainon. So that's the thing. It's, it's important for a person to know that if your priority is to help people, take it seriously. By taking it seriously, that means tell people the truth. Don't steal the truth from people. And tell, no, no, they can't handle it. Who are you to decide what they can handle? If HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote it in the Torah, obviously he knows better than you, no? If he wrote it in the Torah, that means that he knows that he, everybody can handle it. Yeah, but they don't like hearing it. Who's at, Did you have any part of the Torah? Do you have a single verse in the Torah that says you have to like the Torah? Oh, I, the, the Ten Commandments. I am your only God. I took you out of Egypt. Don't, uh, don't uh, you know, uh, worship any other gods. Like my Torah? There's no mitzvah like that. There's no mitzvah like the Torah. Mitzvah to follow it. By following it, you'll love it. You're never going to like it. You're going to love it. What's the difference? Liking it, that means it meets your demands. Loving it means it became part of you. You are the Torah, the Torah is you. There's no question of, oh, should I do it or should I not do it? When you love the Torah... There is no should I, should I not. Torah says, that's what I do. The lungs need air, what do they do? They pump. Do, you, do they ask you for permission? 
Oh, listen, uh, Alex, can we pump now because we need some air? No. It doesn't. When your uterus fills up, does it ask you, oh, listen, uh, uh, Steve, can I, uh, can I uh, empty myself out? No. Guess what? If you disagree with it long enough, it's going to do it anyway. It's going to do it anyway. Why? It needs to do what it needs to do. That's how it works. When you love the Torah, your neshama and the body become the same thing. There's no, should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I pray? Should I not pray? Should I fast? Should I not fast? Should I give? Should I not give? Should I help? Should I not help? There's no such thing. There's no such thing. This is what needs to happen. This is what needs to happen. Now, of course, when you're first starting out, all of what I just said seems foreign to you. Look at that. Should I do it? I'm barely struggling to keep on the fast of Tisha B'Av. What is he talking about? So this is foreign to you. This was foreign to me also when I first started. But the more you learn, the more you do, the more you get to love the Torah. Liking it? No such thing. Scholars like it. That's because they pick and choose what they like. And they ignore what they don't like. This is the goal of all of these Shuim is for us to fall in love with the Torah. But that's, uh, in order for us to do that, we have to understand what's on the line. But that's, that's also why I don't withhold the truth from you guys or anybody out there. Whether you like it, don't like it, it hurts, doesn't hurt. I'm not here to decide what you're going to like or not like or what you can handle, not going to handle if HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote it in the Torah. Apparently, your neshama is programmed to do it. Not just to accept it, but to simply do it. Like it, don't like it. It's your problem. Let's see. Jews are. I, I'm not a terrorist. Uh, I wonder why. Okay. Okay. Uh. Oh, so to finish the answer about Tikkunim. So the first step is to stop the sin. That's what we can pretty much expend it upon for an hour. Second step of uh, doing tshuva is to make sure you don't, you know, to do something to protect yourself from not going back to the sin again. If it's a forbidden relationship, break it, break that relationship up and also do whatever you can to not go back to it, like changing your phone number, moving to a different house, different state, different country, get as far as possible from it as not. You can't be in a forbidden relationship but stay platonic friends. There's no such thing. So uh, uh, if a person wants to uh, uh, do tshuva, they'll have to take steps to stay away from the sin. Third step is to say I'm sorry, cry about it, to uh, understand the magnitude of their sin. But that's usually... They only get to a point of understanding the magnitude of their sin after they've stayed away from the sin for a while. You know, it's just like, for example, if a if a person is uh, goes into a public bathroom, if they're there long enough, they stop noticing how terrible it smells in the public bathroom. When you first go into a public bathroom, it smells awful. But if you're there for, for a few minutes, all of a sudden you forget how bad it smells. And you only notice how bad it smells once you leave the bathroom. Because now you have fresh air again. So when a person is swimming in sin, he doesn't realize how bad it is. So even after he just stopped, he doesn't realize that how bad it was what he was doing, what she was doing. He doesn't realize. It's only after you've left it for a long enough time to realize what good feels like, what good smells like. So that's when you have to say I'm sorry, when you actually understand what it means to say I'm sorry. The fourth step is obviously pass the tests. Hashem is going to send you tests. If it's a forbidden relationship, Hashem is going to send you different forbidden relationship opportunities that you have to obviously reject. If it's a uh, stealing money, Hashem is going to give you other opportunities to steal money, which you obviously have to reject and pass these tests. If you want to uh, fix the past completely, then you need to help other people do tshuva. Uh, and that's in essence what the tikkunim is for. The tikkunim 
is to completely erase the past. To erase all the mistakes that you've made. Because even if you started, let's say for example, you started doing tshuva at uh, 30 years old, that means you were violating Shabbat for at least 17 years in your bar mitzvah. So even if you started keeping Shabbat at 30 years old for the rest of your life, you still have 17 years worth of missing Shabbat that you have to make up for. How can you make up for it? But if you help other people do tshuva, whether it's by raising money like I mentioned before, or by giving him CDs, or giving lectures, or bringing them to lectures, or whatever is way that you use your skill set and ability to do to get people to learn more Torah and do tshuva, when they actually do tshuva, they start keeping Shabbat, it goes to your account also. So now every Shabbat, you keep and they keep, that means you get two Shabbats. Another week, another two Shabbats. Another week, another two Shabbats. They get married to somebody, they help them do tshuva also, all that goes to you also. So every Shabbat for you is three Shabbats. They have kids, three little cuties, four, five, six, ten kids. Guess what? Every Shabbat of yours is 15, 20 Shabbats. Before you know it, instead of waiting 17 years to fix your Chilu Shabbat, it took you three months. So that's why it pays to help people do tshuva. But it's a, uh, but that's, that's in essence the point of tikkunim is to fix the past. Because your current good deeds are good for now, but they don't fix the past. They don't fix the past. They don't fix your, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the past crimes. And that's in essence what we talked about tonight. That's the reason why Hashem allows uh, the Baalei Tshuva to be the most successful Kiruv rabbis that actually help, help people do Tshuva is because part of their reward is to fix their past. The guy that's always been frum, always been religious, doesn't, need, doesn't have much to fix. So he doesn't really need this gift. He would love to have this gift, but he doesn't need this gift. Hashem first gives it to the ones that need the gift. Who needs it? The guy that used to be a criminal. Doesn't necessarily need to be a criminal like he robbed banks. Criminal like he was violating Shabbat. Criminal he was intermarried. Criminal he was uh, doing all types of things. She was doing all types of things. A woman that was walking around not modest for 5, 10, 20, 30 years. She's considered a criminal according to the Torah. Hard tshuva is to help other women do tshuva, become modest and so on. So it's, a, it's important for a person to, uh, uh, to, to get whatever he can get from Hashem. But uh, they have to earn it. All right, we'll take one or two questions and we're finished. Rabbi, are you Chabad? No, I'm human. And I'm Jewish. Uh, but if you're asking me if I attend Chabad, no. I don't attend Chabad. Um, unfortunately, I don't recommend other people attend most Chabad's today either. Because most Chabad's, not all, most Chabad's unfortunately have uh, become part of the problem of uh, lowering the standards of Torah for the sake of publicity and money and so on. So uh, I'm not a fan of that at all. And in fact, most of the heretics that I speak against are from Chabad. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that Chabad as a, as a, uh, as a teaching and as a uh, Hasidut in itself is bad. That is, no, absolutely not. The Tanya is Kodesh Kodeshim. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Rebbe's were Kodesh Kodeshim. But unfortunately, the, 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 the people that are leading Chabad today and many of the communities out there are not doing what the Tanya says. Even though they tell you, listen, let's learn Tanya. They don't actually do what Tanya says. You know, the, uh, I heard a, uh, 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 you know, it's funny, the, the, the Chabad had a few guys, three Chabad Bachurim, called me the other day, leave a message, like a two and a half minute message. You know, just busting my chops, making fun of me and all types of stuff. And... Uh, this is the product. They went to the Chabad system, the uh, yeshiva system, and what are they doing? They're calling a rabbi that's not Chabad to go make fun of him and you know insult him and so on and so forth. I said, okay, fine. Shemachem, poor people. Uh, but one of the things that they, uh, they uh, have a problem with, me, is that I speak out against heretics. Interestingly enough, the uh, one of the uh, Chabad people that I uh, just learned recently, he uh, his name is Shai Taub, Rabbi Shai Taub, 
Um, he actually spoke against a person a few months ago that I spoke out against. Even though he's Chabad. He spoke out against uh, the other guy, what is his name? Uh, Prager, Prager, that noif, that, uh, that filth that he is. Because Prager goes on these uh, programs claiming to be the representation of Judaism. And he says that pornography is not a problem, even though it's against the Torah. And he's a, he's a filthy, disgusting heretic. But uh, he's, a co- he's a constant guest in Chabad houses. They, they host him all the time. So anyway, this Rabbi Shaul Taub, which unfortunately is also friends with some of the people that are actually are outright heretics, he's actually a Tamit Chacham. He, uh, he spoke out against uh, Dennis Prager. But you don't see anybody in the comments saying, oh, this is Lashon Hara. how can you speak out against a Jew? You know, all Jews are holy. Everyone has a share of the world to come. You don't see that. Even though he said that Dennis Prager is dangerous to listen to, and what he said is dangerous, you don't see anybody saying this is Lashon Hara. Nobody says Lashon Hara. Only when Yaron Uven says it's Lashon Hara. Only when it's against Chabad. Representatives which are not really Chabad representatives, they're just pretending to be Chabad representatives, then it's Lashon Allah. But if it's Chabad doing it, it's not Lashon Allah. Same concept with teaching about, you know, uh, one of the things I didn't like about is uh, what he said, is like, oh, I don't want this to sound like uh, fire and brimstone. What do you mean? You're rebuking somebody, it's a mitzvah. It's like almost like they have this like deformity in their mind, like you're not allowed to rebuke. But Tanya, Chapter 8 rebukes everybody for wasting time. He says that people who waste time are going to go to Kafakela, special place in Kafakela, where they're going to get suffering beyond your imagination. Suffering that makes my Gehenna movie sound like Ganeden. This is, if you have the Tanya book, this is like, if the English version, figure the first 30, 40 pages. My memory, is, my memory is correct. If it's the red book, it's page 32. He says, that's just for wasting time. We're not talking about people that say the Shonara because for surely nothing is enough for those people. Much, much worse. The Tanya, the Tanya itself rebukes with fire of fire. Forget fire and brimstone. Fire of fire. Some of the great Golim says, how did he fit such a great God in such a small book? Like, how did he do all this? Kodesh Kodeshim Tanya. And they say, no, let's go learn Tanya. What Tanya are you learning, you chamorim? What Tanya are you learning? Tanya is full of Kedusha, full of Yirat Shamayim, full of everything. But you have chamorim making fun of the Torah, making fun of different, uh, different parts of the Torah, different mitzvot. So if those are the people that are representing Chabad, Chabad is not Chabad anymore. You want to know Chabad? Go, learn Tanya if you want. But many of the Israel say, don't learn Tanya until you know all the other basics. You know the entire Shas, you know Poskim, you know the Chumash, you know the Tanakh, you know everything else. Why? Because Tanya is very high level. But who do they teach Tanya? They teach Baal Tshuva Tanya. They don't even know Chumash, but they teach them Tanya. So what ends up happening? Eh, you have a generation of ignorant people. They pretend to learn Tanya. They don't even understand anything. They tell, no, no, you're not allowed to rebuke. Which, which book did you read? Which book did you read? So that's why I don't believe they actually learn Tanya. I don't believe they learn anything. I believe that most of these people don't know anything. At all. I think they're completely I don't think they know Parashat Shavua. I don't think they do Certainly there are some Tamid HaChamim in Chabad. But those people that we're referring to always, that let people violate Shabbat without a care in the world, and uh, they, there's a God needs you type of mentality, those people are ignoramuses of ignoramuses. They don't know anything. They don't know anything. So it's, well, it's one of two options. Either they're the most evil people since Yerovam ben Nevat, or they're ignoramuses. I'm hoping it's just igno- ignoramuses because ignorance you could actually fix. That's it. Uh, I'm trying to... Yeah, good luck with that, buddy. Uh, York. Uh, okay. 
Okay, guys, thank you very much for learning with me. Uh, by the way, anybody, again, wants to donate, wants to contribute, the campaign is bhshas.org, or you can just simply donate on the regular website. Uh, this will be the last shoe in person for a little while. I'm going to be going to Eretz Yisrael, Bezat Hashem Shun. But uh, we will be doing shulim, we will be in touch, we will be available. Uh, so uh, we're not leaving the planet, we're just leaving my house for a little while. Uh, so uh, everything continues, Bezat Hashem. We're going to have a lot of new stuff come out on the channel, aside from the lectures. While I'm not doing lectures for a little while, uh, it's going to be some other stuff that has been cooking for... A long time, a few things to expect. There's going to be an upgrade on the app, a lot of new stuff. There's going to be a bunch of new chuva stories aside from the uh, podcast. Uh, there's going to be a, uh, at some point, uh, uh, a new film that's it's ready already. I just have to decide when to release it. Probably it's going to be during the holidays, like, you know, the Cholomoy part. It's a new film. Uh, there is a uh, also whole questions and answers thing. There's, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff going on. We'll come out with all of it and uh, help obviously do tshuva. Anyone that wants to uh, take up some of the ideas that we discussed and put into practice, you have my blessing that HaKadosh Baruch will bless you a thousandfold in this world and the next and much more uh, than what you actually end up doing because every single effort that you do to help our organization, I am certain you'll get rewarded for it both in this world and the next. And Bezat Hashem, all of you take the opportunity and do it not just once, not just twice, but on a regular basis. Baruch Adonai Lo'olam. Amen v'amen. זה ידידי הרב ירון ראובן שמסר את נפשו ומוסר את נפשו ולכן ידידיי ואהוביי אני רוצה לעשות לו כאן הפתעה הערב אני צריך מכם עשרה או בחורים או אברכים שיקבלו עליהם ללמוד את הש"ס בשנה שבע דפים ליום שלוש וחצי שעות ביום בעזרת השם יזכו במלגה מכובדת מארגון בעזרת השם ש"ס בשנה מי שהראשון מוזמן הראשונים יבואו לשולחן הנשיאות בזריזות, בזריזות. ברוך השם, 17 לומדי תורה שקיבלו על עצמם את סיום הש"ס. 17 סיומי ש"ס בשנה לכבודה של תורה, לכבוד עם ישראל, לכבוד הקדוש ברוך הוא שישתבח בבנה ויאמר בני בכורי ישראל עמלי תורה שקיבלו על עצמם לבוא וללמוד שבע דפים ביום לבוא ולזכות את עם ישראל ברוכים תהיו